All right, good evening, folks. The time is 5.30. This is a regular board meeting of the San Benito CISD Board of Trustees. Today is Wednesday, April 12th, and I call this meeting to order. We begin with roll call. Mr. Mario Silva. Present. Oscar Medrano. Present. Rudy Corona. Present. Dr. Ariel Cruz. Frutoso M. Present. Gomez, Jr. Present. Orlando Lopez. Present. Teresa Cervellon. Present. Stephen Weller. Here he is. Can you hear us, sir? Mr. Weller, can you hear us? He said yes. Was that a yes? Mr. Weller, can you hear us? We can't hear you. We can see you. Can you hear us, Mr. Weller? He can't hear us. But he can't hear us. And I am here, so we do have a quorum. We begin with item 1.2 and 1.3, the Pledge of Allegiance and our invocation. Mr. Medrano. <clears throat> Leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance uh, from Frank Roberts Elementary is Adelise Garza. Adelise Garza is a fourth grade student at Frank Roberts Elementary. She is the daughter of Denise Castillo and Jose Garza. Adelise is an A honor roll student and always strives to do her best. She is a cheerleader, chess player, and part of the choir team at her campus. Adelise attends South motion gymnastics in the evenings because she wants to become a varsity cheerleader when she's older. She also attends CCD once a week because having strong faith is important for her. Adelise is proud dog mom of a 120 pound Great Dane. Wow. wow. 
Adelie's career goal is to become a pediatrician and help her community. Nia sent the invocation also from Frank Roberts is Sinaya Quesada. Sinaya Quesada is the daughter of Patricia and Christopher Quesada. She is a fifth grade student at Frank Roberts Elementary and has attended Frank Roberts for six years. Her favorite subject is math and she enjoys being a member of the ACE after school program at her school. She is on the chess team, cheer and dance team and soccer team. She also sings in the choir. Some of her accomplishments include being in our gifted and talented program, participating and placing in sec uh, second in our district spelling bee, as well as uh, consistently being on the A honor roll. Please stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance and Invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one indivisible. And now for a moment of silence. Thank you. You may be seated. Please stand up for the invocation. Eternal God, we pray that you bless us in this meeting and keep us. Lord, may your face shine on us and be gracious to us. We pray that we feel your presence during this meeting because you are with us wherever we go. We pray that this meeting focuses upon you and your plans for us as a school community and a community of believers. Amen. Amen. We have a certificate for you and a, a gift of, of our appreciation. If you want to come up. Let's take a picture. Will the parents of these fine students please stand up and be recognized at this time? And Principal Dr. Quesada, thank you, Principal, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. We appreciate you, good job, girls. Okay, we move on to item two, uh, special recognition. Ms. Adrian? Yes, sir. So tonight we have several groups that we will be recognizing and commending for great performances and uh, great efforts. We're going to go ahead and start tonight with the San Diego High School Business Professionals of America, Chapter 3, for their regional, state, and national efforts, and they're also qualifiers. So I uh, will turn it over to Mr. Rosa. All right, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, President Moreno, 
uh, board members and uh, superintendents that we on. Uh, tonight, we are gonna do uh, celebrate some of our successes, a little story about, about these groups that will be coming up. Uh, when we get to January, I tell the kids, okay, this is it, football season's over, basketball season's over, it's CTE season. This is the time that we go out and we compete and we show off what we've been doing up to now. The groups that you're gonna see today, uh, keep in mind, these are all, all of them are state qualifiers, okay? I tell them, you know, that, that, that's something to be proud of. Whether you place or not, you made it to state. There are hundreds, if not thousands of kids don't, don't ever get to that point. They don't get past the valley. So all these groups that you're seeing here, they're either one first, second, third, in the valley. So they're, you know, some of the best kids in the valley who represented. So I mean, it was represented well all over the state because these kids travel all over the place. So we're gonna start with our first group here. Of course, San Manuel High School, Business Professional of America, Chapter Three. Uh, they went, they're actually three different competitions. Regional Leadership in Westlaco. Let me start with our students, that way I can give their honors. Mm -hmm. First on the list, Kaylee Trevino for Payroll Accounting Regional Fourth Place. Karen Cardosa, Health, Insurance, and Medical Billing. Rihanna Lopez, Basic Office System Procedures, second place at Regionals. And of course, our teacher and our sponsor, Cynthia Sartuche, if she could step up. A little bit about Karen Cardoza. She plays first place at regionals, second place at state, and she will tra be traveling to Anaheim, California to represent us at nationals. So that, that's Karen. <laughs> Raise your hand, Karen. Where are you? Raise your hand. There you go. Again, they competed in Westlaco for regionals. They went to state uh, in Dallas, and of course, our national qualifier will be going to Anaheim, California. Will the parents please stand up and be recognized if you're here? Anybody here? There we go. Thank you so much. State was for them was held in Dallas, Texas, March March 2nd through the 5th. All right, thank you. All right, moving on. Our next group, our Business Professional America, a different, uh, a different chapter here. We're, we'll go with uh, Kataya Calva, regional fourth place state qualifier, health administration procedures. <laughs> Nayeli Gonzalez, regional third place state qualifier, ICD 10 CM. Medical Diagnostics. Victor Loya, Regional First Place State Qualifier. Networking and Administration. I don't know if Victor's here. Brianna Marquez, Regional Fifth Place State Qualifier. Marcos Ontiveros, Regional Fifth Place State Qualifier. Device Configuration Troubleshooting. Marcos is also one of our national qualifiers. He'll be, driving, he'll be uh, going to Anaheim, California. All right. And of course, Elizabeth Ramos. Elizabeth Ramos, third place, state qualifier. Intermediate word processing. And one of our sponsors, Diana Zuniga. There you go. Again, they competed at state in Dallas, Texas, March 2nd through the 5th, just earlier this year, okay? I think I've got a couple more. Let me, no, this is the group. Wait, Sergio, you're gonna take a picture of this one? Oh, I'm sorry, parents, if you're here, please stand up, be recognized.
Thank you all. A little bit about this group is another uh, Business Professional America Re Regional Leadership Conference. Uh, this is a group of ninth graders that made it to state. All right, so the, the future for these guys are, uh, is looking really good. Uh, Catalina Morales, fourth place. Joey Barra, first place, Death Drop Publishing. Joe's not here. I'm going to present Mr. Ray Garcia, our sponsor, also. They both ranked in the top five in their events and advanced to state level in Dallas, Texas, also. Parents, please stand up if you're here. Uh, to be recognized. Thank you. Joey Barra couldn't make it today. All right, moving on again with our San Mateo High School group. Uh, a little bit different here, Regional State Teach for Tomorrow Summit, uh, Children's Literature, Storybook Design, top five finalist winners. Okay, they advanced to state competitions, Cecilia Calva, Bethany Martinez. I'm gonna go ahead and bring in uh, Ms. Dolores de la Fuente, our sponsor. Is she out there? She might not be. There she is. All right. Well, the parents of these young ladies, if you're here, please stand to be recognized. Thank you all so much. While we're at it, I'm going to bring another group because Ms. De La Fuente is the sponsor for this the next group also. Lindsay Montemayor, first place gold certi certificate. Ezequiel Marquez. Israel Valdez, Madison Ramirez. <laughs> Will the parents of this young man, if you're here, please stand up. All right, one more group. Again, Ms. Dole Fuente, don't go anywhere. All right. Harley Naranjo, the students need to come back. Oh, yeah, we need to take a picture. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I was great. Uh, which group is next? Harley Naranjo? There we go. <laughs> Alexis Rios? Ismael Lerma? And Alessandra Gallegos. These first er, all earned first place. Right. You want me to continue with your group? She's got a nice group. All right, next, next group, Blue Ribbon Gold Certificates. Both of these students, 11th graders, they'll be back with us next year. Ayla Rojas. Or Aaliyah. It's Aaliyah. Abigail Avalos. Some of these were team competitions. Would the parents of these young ladies, if you're here, please stand up. Thank you all so much. One more group for Ms. De La Fuente. This is part of Taffy Gold, is that correct? All right. Carlos Panola. Desiree Garcia. Trisha Perdraza. And Gabriela Montes. This group also received the first place award. 
They competed at Kalahari in, in Round Rock, Texas. Would the parents of these young ladies and student and young men stand up, please? Thank you. Well, let's take a picture of this group. We still have more. <laughs> For this group, yes. Yeah, we'll get them all in here. All right. Breakout session, presentation, first place winners at regionals, gold medal winners at state, Lillian Rodriguez. <laughs> Brianna Marquez. <laughs> Cecilia Calva. <laughs> Ezequiel Garza Marquez. <laughs> Jada Rodriguez. It's Ayani Santiago. These were all first place gold medalist winners, okay? Would the parents please stand up if you're here for these students? All right, this group, this last group, Lillian, y'all step up a little bit, okay? Lillian, Brianna, Cecilia, Ezekiel, Jada, and Itziani. Please step forward. I would just, I want to make a, just, just to, this whole group here will be advancing to nationals. They'll be traveling to Orlando, Florida. A couple more we can need to add here. Hannah Trunell. And Emily Delgado. Not sure if they're here today. Okay, I know they they they, they are. They we're both at practice. All right, I think we've got everybody here. That was Taffy Go. We'll get a picture now. Nice round of applause. It's a big group right here. Thank you. This is our, what we call our Taffy Group. This is Texas Association of Future Educators. All right, so a lot of future teachers right there coming up. That was part of our Taffy Gold. We do have a Taffy Purple. We'll start with these. Daniela Quintero. <laughs> Top five in the state. She will be advancing to nationals as well. Isabella Medrano. Maricela Cuellar. Mariana Nieto. And Laura Calva. Thank you, Laura. Would the parents of these young ladies please stand if you're here? Thank you so much. Again, state qualifiers, and one of them will be going to nationals in Florida as well. I can't forget our sponsor, Brenda Aguilar. I don't know if I saw her. Probably not. That was that last group right here. We can take a picture of this one. Great job. 
All right, the next group that we're going to highlight is our FCCLA. This stands for Family, Con uh, Family Career and Community Leaders of America. Uh, another group that traveled to Dallas for a state competition against state qualifiers, and some of them placed at state as well. I'm going to read off this list, starting with Clarissa Martinez. She received a second place at state. Natasha Lara. Second place at state. Haley Reyes. Also received a second. Ana Jimenez. Amanda Alvarado. Audrey Muniz. Israel Valdez. All right, Israel. Hannah Trunell. She's at practice. <laughs> Kaylin Salinas. Ekaterina Cruz. She was one of our top fives in the talent show. Impressive. Mariah Garcia. Alejandra Agado. Reynaldo Reyes. Daisy Esquivel. Cecilia de la Cruz. Gardiel Garcia. Daniela Herman. Herman. Kiara Cepeda. And of course, our sponsor, Veronica Trevino. A little tidbit about our sponsor. This is her first year teaching here in San Benito, and she's got all these kids going to state. Great job. All right, we can get a picture in this one. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, the parents, please, if you're here, stand up. Second year teaching. It's been two years already. <laughs> oh. They're sporting their casual wear today. Okay. <laughs> Believe me, when they compete, they wear a blazer. They look really sharp out there. I look out of place when I travel with them. Thank you all so much. Congratulations. I know several of our kids are either at a softball practice, baseball practice, one or the other competition. So I got a couple more here for our HOSA, uh, Health Occupation Services. Uh, they were also placed at the state level. Uh, this first group, Cruz Estrada, Estrada, I'm not sure if he's here or not, but the sponsor might hear, Christina, or Christine Cantu. Cruz Estrada, he advanced the state in sports medicine, believe it or not. The next group, Faith Rodriguez and Anaí Garcia. Not sure if Mr. Jaime Barra, I just want to make their names. These were our EMT, first place in the Valley, and advanced the state as well. So we can get a picture with Christine there. So.
Will Christine's parents please stand up? Yeah. <laughs> that was our last group right there. Thank you all. Thank you, board members. Oh, by the way, just a little bit of extra information. It's only half the group that we had for tonight. The next group, we've got to cover our skills and our FFA, and we're going to talk about the awards for them as well. So nice big group. We have probably had about over 300 students that competed, maybe 400 students, but over 300 students that competed at the state level. So thank you all very much. Mr. Board President, are you able to hear me? Mr. Moreno, are you able to hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You are able to hear me? Yes, sir, we are. We can. Confirm. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, folks, the next item on our agenda is public comment. Before we begin, I will remind our audience members of the board's procedures for handling public comment. The public comment portion of our meeting is available to members of the public who wish to address any topic. Anyone who would like to speak during public comment must sign in prior to the start of the meeting and list the topic or topics they want to discuss. Each public comment speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to address the board for each topic. If more than 10 speakers are signed up to speak on the same topic, all additional speakers on that item shall be limited to two minutes. However, any public testimony speaker who requires a translator will receive up to six minutes to address the board. <coughs> Please keep your comments or criticisms civil and courteous. Please avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others during your opportunity to speak. Lastly, we ask that you do not discuss students who are not your own children. If a speaker is seeking board resolution of a specific complaint, that concern should be addressed through the district's grievance process. District policy DGBA has been established for addressing employee complaints, policy FNG, is the avenue for filing parent complaints, and policy GF addresses community member complaints. Grievance forms can be obtained at any campus administration office or at the district central administration offices. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is Mary Maney. Ms. Maney, welcome. Okay, you want me to do the timing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Ms. Cerveon will do, be doing the timer today. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Board President. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Savion and board members and the community. Um, really kind of short on this. I do want to say uh, a couple thank yous that kind of get uh, for people that are kind of sliding out. All those CTE students that have traveled and all that, there is a big thank you that needs to go out to Gloria Hernandez for the work she does in keeping CTE and a whole lot of us on track with being able to do these field trips and all this. It is very helpful to have her around. Um, again, uh, these are people, these are things that you take for granted after a while and it just helps to come back and mention that there is a thank you for them. Um, again, um, the stipends uh, uh, that's listed on thank you for addressing the concerns that Mr. Yasasi brought up and actually doing something for the teachers that are involved in all this. It is very appreciative. And the last one I wanted to talk about was the BED. Um, thank you for clarifying. It was not five items, but five minutes per. Um, the only thing I did, a uh, question I did come back in looking at it again, is that five minutes per committee or is that just five minutes for the day? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because every time we have the committees, you've got separate agendas. Each agenda has a public comment section on it. And does that mean we need to fill out multiple forms for each of the different committee meetings or not? Just something to think about when you're doing that. Uh, so again, uh, I do appreciate you're doing this. I do, I, uh, do appreciate you're sending out, again, all of the calls for the calendar voting for those that did not get it the first time around. Um, and I'm glad to see that that's on the agenda too. And we've got a homecoming date now, so now we just get another half day added to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maney. Our next speaker is Rosalinda G. Garcia. Ms. Garcia, welcome. 
Good evening, board and the public superintendent. My first um, topic on the agenda is the 9.2B D local. I'm a strong advocate for freedom of speech, and especially here at the with the school board, uh, not to intimidate anyone to speak. I might not agree with everybody's, like I told B Palomino when she first started to come to board meetings. I might not agree with her comments, but I'm glad she's up here speaking. And I do not appreciate a board member to intimidate me not to put what I want to on social media. Whatever's out there, anybody can share it. It's out there, and those are my opinions. And he's not gonna stop me from posting my opinions. Dr. Carmen did not stop me from posting my opinion. And I have that email to back me up, that he brought it to my attention, that somebody out there told him. So, to that board member, if you're unsatisfied with my opinions based on, my, on facts, go straight to an attorney because I'm not gonna stop. Thank you. On the, oh, and regarding, I still have time on that. Be the local, I'm glad we're moving forward and not backwards. Where it was removed because board members were unhappy because of persons opinions or comments. So I'm glad you're moving forward to give as much an opportunity for everyone to come up here. Thank you. The 5.1 agenda item, it's on the topic of the superintendent's report. I'm glad you do things the way policy states. I, somebody commented or posted opinion when Dr. Carmen took it upon himself to do a statement and they allowed him, it was against policy. And not just I posted about that, other community members see it too. So thank you board for following policy and not make it where it's comfortable to, or uncomfortable some and then there's trouble. There's trouble for the district. And on the other one is a 6.2 construction update. I'm sticking to the, to the construction update. There's gonna be some discussion. Um, when the uh, bond was approved and they picked the Miss Brighton group, you know, one of my first comments that I came up there, up here, that uh, it was that I wasn't against the bond, the facilities, it was a price tag, and that it was so rushed. The bond committee, and then we have, a, they picked Brighton, and speaking of Brighton, on his RFQ, he, on his RFQ, he uh, he delivers that it will it'll be delivered on time. Well, it hasn't. Nothing has been delivered on time. Will it be according to budget? No, it hasn't been according to budget. And it's all here on the forensic audit. They didn't the board didn't account for inflation, so it's not all because of the COVID. No, they didn't, they didn't plan it right. And it's on the forensic audit, and it disappoints me that there's no score, score sheets. So when you hear this update tonight, I hope you make some good recommendations because this mistake is gonna be very costly to the district. And it's strange that there's no score sheets on this venture that they picked, Brighton Group. And like I said, on his RFQ, will it, it'll be on time, it'll be on budget, at the best quality, 
we don't have the best quality on the auditorium. And right away, they started to cut down. I was here. I heard it. I heard it. And would you build, would you, would you pay the builder 200000 to build your house and then start the building? It just blows my mind. And like Michael Vargas said, when they were starting this, one time he told another board member, somebody didn't do his homework. Well, somebody didn't do their homework with this bond facilities. I have total confidence that we'll move in the right direction with this up, uh, update on the construction and also what legal ramifications we have regarding the previous, I don't know if he's still the uh, pro project manager, but I up, hope we take some legal ramifications. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Garcia. Our next uh, public speaker is uh, Jesus Aguilera. Mr. Aguilera, welcome. I stand corrected to the principles. I got your message. I support my superintendent. I love my superintendent. Okay. I also believe in our superintendent, and I'm glad she's here. All right. Let me see. The building. It's another topic. The building, since we're still in the old time. The building. Forty million dollars. There's only one person left here for that just totally mess up part. And like you're going to find out later, they're going to have to tear down those buildings and restart because they're in the wrong position. So I think I'm going to dedicate a plaque to them. OK? To the six people, we always pick on, on this board president. But this board, this board member, he stood here and said, let's give that job to them. So these are the six people that are to blame for all of that. Okay. I'm also going to talk about B. Palomino and Rosie, because I know them. Look, they're going to come up here and speak, and we need to hear them out. They might not be right all the time, but most of the time they're going to be right. And this is their thing. If you can help one, one student, then you've done your, your, your thing. You know, teachers, I hear them all the time. If I can save one student, that's what they're here for, to save whatever they can for the students. That's why we're all here. We talk differently, but we're all here. OK, my other one. Look, guys, you're all going to vote on whatever minutes we get to speak. I hear you. I think we can do it in five minutes, total speaking. We come here, we do our homework, and, and we get it done. We don't need 30 minutes, 15 minutes. We can do it with five minutes, if that's what you want. But remember, they used to shut me down and then put me at the end of the meeting with no video. I didn't care. I was the last one. I brought it down to three minutes. People that I helped. 
and then they, they went and brought it down. Y lo traen a ese superintendent. And you know what? They always call me and tell me, Chuy, he's got so much brown on his nose and not even funny. So, ¿Quién está riéndose? Ah, qué bueno. Anyway, este, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aguilera. Our next speaker is Brianna Gallegos. Good evening. My name is Brianna Gallegos. I am here to speak on behalf of Greyhounds Online Go Academy. Let me start with Mrs. McGee and her team have done a superb job opening this program. I currently have two children enrolled in this program. As a parent, this program has been an extraordinary and safe experience for my family. I have homeschooled my kids since they began pre-kinder, and this was our first year enrolled with a school district. Let me tell you, my kids have come a long way in a matter of months academically. Not only do they feel safe learning from the comfort of their own homes, but they've also been able to gain the experience of professional teachers, as well as expanding their social skills with kids their ages. Mrs. Roundtree has been an ex excellent principal and very open in communicating with families and available upon requests. The teachers have been truly amazing as well. It takes a lot of patience to be able to teach these kids through a screen. They connect with us at all times with any information needed. There's always a teacher available to the students in between classes, as well as to the parents. Our family has really enjoyed the field trips and little get-togethers they involve our students with. The program is very family-oriented, and, and what's better than family, right? My husband and I are able to be rest assured that our kids are in good hands with Go Academy. This has been an excellent decision for our family, and we cannot wait for our son to join the crew. My kids are really looking forward to staying enrolled next year, and we plan in keeping them with Go Academy throughout their future school years. Thank you, and Go Hounds. Thank you, Ms. Gallegos. Okay, our next speaker is Adano Seguera. Mr. Oseguera, welcome. Good evening, board members, uh, board president, superintendents. I just wanted to speak quickly about uh, the BD local revision. Um, I think one of the most important things for public comment is for it to be accessible and for it not to be limiting. Um, we've had several parents come recently. I think that's very encouraging, and I think the last thing we want to do is uh, limit that. So I would suggest to make it open to any topic, regardless of the meeting. And I think five minutes is extremely reasonable. But again, um, open public comment, I think, would be best. And again, uh, five minutes is reasonable. So that's it. Thank you. Mr. Oseguera, thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Gasca. Good evening. My name is Maria Gasca. I'm here because of bullying. I mean, my concerns are at this point right now because I'm living it as a parent with my two children, elementary, Sullivan, and middle school, uh, Berta Cavaza. My concerns are, what is, what is gonna be the procedures that are taken? I have done protocol. My first incident back on January the 30th at Sullivan Elementary, and it was a bullying from the teacher to my son. My concern is, Superintendent, I spoke to her. She called me around 6.04, and I spoke to her. They did whatever it had to be done at that moment. But from that day to this day, 
Nobody else has called to see how my son is doing. My son stopped eating. My son was not sleeping because of the bullying that she had been doing. My, his grades had gone down. I had requested to be changed from teacher, and now, you know, I had noticed that he picked up his grades from what he was doing to now because I've been taking him to, you know, some counseling. But what's your concern? How are y'all taking this? Um, now I have another incident, uh, March 30th. Berta Cavaza, a student, uh, told my son that if he didn't do his homework, he was going to be threatened with a pocket knife. I spoke to the principal. The principal tried to avoid me. I, I decided as a parent to stand up and wait until he had the time to take care of it. I, did, I, I skipped coming to superintendent because if you didn't bother for the first situation to even come and ask me, my son said, they're not going to do anything, mom, because they didn't do nothing on the first one with my brother. So for me, it's my concern. What are y'all waiting for? For my son to be killed? Me as a parent, I feel threatened for my son. My son saw that she was supposed to be removed. Yes, she was removed. This, was, this happened on a Friday. I put a police report there from the school. And then Monday comes, my son goes to school. Tuesday, he goes to the restroom. The first thing he sees there is that little girl where, you know, that threatened him. He was afraid. He went to the restroom back again, and, and I said, what did you do? I couldn't come out because she was there. She threatened him you know, with other little kids, even though she's not there. What is the procedure? What's going to happen? I fear for my, for my child, and not only my child. It's every parent that is silent and doesn't decide to talk because where are you guys? You know, what are you guys really doing? Are, is, do you all really care for our children? Your time is up, ma'am, on that topic. Thank you. Well, now I understand why when principals were changed last year, now I understand why Sullivan, principal, and Berta Cavazza, principal, weren't moved. Now I do. Our next uh, uh, public speaker is Lori M. Hernandez. Ready? Good evening, board president, superintendent, and the committee. Thank you for having me here today, and I wanted to thank you and thank everybody here also for bringing forth their concerns that they have, because I believe it is very vital for you all to hear and to intake that information wholeheartedly. My concern is communication. I came to you guys three weeks ago. I showed up last week and I presented my information, things that I thought were vital and critical in all aspects of children. And I still, to date, I have not gotten a call from anybody. Correction. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Corona and Mr. Silva. I appreciate you always willing to take that initiative to extend your, your help. So I do appreciate you all for that. Ms. Servion, I came to you, and I came to you on a heart-to-heart -heart basis. And I said, please, you know, I need, technically it's an outcry, and I do it to advocate for everybody. Unfortunately, to this day, three weeks now, and I have not got, not an email from you, not a phone call, anything. So it, it's a questionable doubt. Where do we stand? It, it, it's to the point where it's frustrating already. I don't know you, Mr. Moreno. I don't know who you are on a personal level. I don't know you at all. I just know you, that you're the face of the board. You're our president. So I actually, as a community member, I hold your standards high, you know, as a board, because you should be leading by example. Nonetheless, I came and I voiced my concern to you, and what you did was, you didn't intake any of my concerns. What you did was you went on social media, you looked for me, and you unfriended me. But I did get a message before that, right here, from you, asking for a vote. You asked me to vote for you, but you couldn't take the time to stand up for what is right? You couldn't take the time to hear a parent concern? What initiative are we taking? What's happening to our board? It's frustrating and it gets me very emotional because I mean, what it, it may not matter to you guys, anything that I say, 
but it's been an ongoing issue for a lot of people who care. And to this point, I don't understand where our board is going. We are all divided, and it's certain people who make it divided. I hear there's always people talking about the past, the past, the past. The past is the past. We're present now. It's moving forward. People decide to say about Dr. Cartman, people talk negative about him, and that's okay because everybody expresses their own opinions and I respect everybody's decisions to the fullest. However, for me and the past experience that I've had with our board has been phenomenal. We've had a parent here, I went back and we've had a parent asking for a simple clock, a clock. Do we take into consideration that? Your time is up on that topic, ma'am. Thank you. You may proceed. Is it political tactics? Yes, is that my next one? My next one is political tactics. Another reason that I feel this way, again, I brought forth my concerns to you at our last board meeting. I expressed how we need to be united as a community. I expressed how we need to lead by example. I expressed that we are mentors for our children. Everybody sees, and again, yes, I, I understand people mentioned they can post whatever they want on social media. Of course, they can. However, as a board, what is our responsibility for that? What is our responsibility? Because I came to you and I said, you know what, Mr. Moreno, again, I don't have anything. I, I expressed my complete feelings to you wholeheartedly. And I told you what I felt, how it looked on children. Nonetheless, you cared less. What you did was you technically unfriended me when I didn't even know you were my friend to begin with. You unfriended me. And you went along and you still posted. You spoke ill of another board member three hours later, advocating for yourself, but downgrading and degrading a board member. That speaks volumes. And that speaks volumes of your character. Again, board, like, this is who we come to. This is our board. Unity, being united, being there for our children, stepping up for what is right, providing positive structure, leading by example, instilling good morals and respect. We talk about bullying. Obviously, there's been a lot of issues about bullying, and sadly, sad to say that it hasn't gone resolved. There's been no resolved for bullying, and that is heartbreaking right there. That brings the self-esteem of children down. Where is our moral character? And when we have a board president, our board president bullying on social media, bullying our board member, that speaks volume of your character. And it is ridiculous. We need change and we cry for change. That is what we need. I envision total, something totally different. And again, the sad thing is before it led to this, I reached out to you guys. And what is upsetting is you literally showed that what I have to say is no essence to you. It's not critical enough. And that is what makes parents upset. That is what makes parents frustrated. It's the continued faults on your all's end, not the parents. I was bringing back a clock. I was talking about a clock. We had a parent come out and voice. You know what, I've heard her for two months now asking for a simple clock, which I think, again, is a phenomenal idea. Put a clock there, because we as community members, we want to see our time. We want to see our countdown. We want to see what points we have left. We want to talk. We want to express our feelings. There's nothing wrong, and what I did was, and I tried my best, I went to Walmart today, both Salmonito, Harlingen, I went to Target, I went to Hobby Lobby, so I can donate you a clock, so you can put there, so people can see their times, because Your that's time not a lot to topic, ask for. Thank you. Next topic. Accountability. Accountability. Accountability is vital. We know my concern first and foremost here, was meeting the needs of children when it was done positively and fairly. That was my concern, is the children. I tried coming to you guys because, again, it's con pertaining to cheerleading, which cheerleading is very vital to a lot of children. We actually just heard a young little girl saying how she envisioned of being a cheerleader when she grew up. But what are we doing to our program? What are we doing? You know what we're doing? We're holding our children accountable is what we're doing. We eliminated a JV team. 
Why would we do that? Why? Is JV not of essence to you? Is it not vital to you? Does JV not matter? Are our kids not good enough? What is it? I came and I tried. I tried speaking to the principal. Where is the problem? Cheer has been an ongoing issue for about four years now. Do we take into consideration who the principal of Cheer is? It's not the children's fault. Mr. Abrigo is the principal who's been there for four years now. Four years. He has been there. And the past four years, that program has gone down. What we decided to do was we decided, I went and I spoke to him, like I stated. I tried to voice my thoughts and my concerns before a cheerleading tryouts and just said, you know what? Take into consideration these kids. A JV team is needed. JV team is vital. That's our team where they can grow, they learn, they prep for a varsity level. Instead, we decided to ruin their hearts and say, no, you know what Mr. Abrigo told me? I asked him, why would we eliminate a JV team? Again, my daughter's not a JV, she's a varsity member, but I'm advocating what I feel is right. For children, that's who I'm advocating for. So I went to Mr. Abrigo, and he had the audacity to say, well, it's because of all of the, the past history, we decided to eliminate a JV team. Are you kidding me now? You are the principal, cheer principal, Eddie Abrigo, is the cheer principal. He's a political figure, so I, I believe I can speak, I can say his name, right? Actually, he's not a political figure. He's not running for a uh, commissioner? He is not a political figure at this time. Okay, well, but the cheer principal I refer to is him. So he is the cheer principal. I went to him and I asked and I advocated for that team. I advocated because it's not fair to them. And he had the audacity to tell me that. After we've been humiliated on social media, I figured you all would have taken that initiative to oversee the cheerleading program. And that's the reason I went to him ahead of time. Instead, okay, your time is that's up on that topic. I have a question, Ms. Hernandez. Yes, the sir? next one, you have cost and fundraising. Is that together? Yes, it's together. Okay, you may begin. That's another issue. I went to the cheer, uh, to Mr. Well, to the cheer program. I guess assistant principal. I went to him and I mentioned the extent of the cost: two thousand one hundred and eight dollars to be a cheerleader. Are you kidding me? And I told you this, and I brought this to your attention. We are a Title I school. What are we doing? What are we doing? I'm coming with good intentions. Again, we're not taking into consideration that we have children out there who are highly talented, but cannot afford that. You give them a price tag of $2,108. We say cheerleading is a privilege. Is it really? Is cheerleading a privilege? We're paying $2,108. I voiced this to the principal. And I said, why are we doing this? Why do we need two pairs of tennies? Why do we need a pink uniform for October? A pink uniform that we're gonna wear for three games for the month of October? Why do we need three sets of uniforms or practice gear at $120 each? Like these are vital concerns. There's other vendors. I understand varsity is legitimately the best as we say in cheer. However, we are a campus, we are a school, we are an economy that is going down right now. And you all cannot take into consideration meeting the needs of children, not understanding that the attendance rate goes up, not understanding the grades go up, not understanding that at this point you're breaking kids' hearts because when they saw that price tag, it dropped. I get it, the sponsor, she, the, she has good intentions and I, and I give it to her, she's a good sponsor. At the end of the day, this falls on you guys. Because when we come to you guys for help, it doesn't get done. Like the team placement. And that's why I say, what are we doing? Are we voting for the right people? Because everything that I've done, I've done it and I've given you my entire heart trying to get through to you guys. And it does become frustrating when we get no feedback, we get no answers, not even a simple email stating, you know what, Ms. Hernandez? I received your email, I'll contact you back. Three weeks later, and my thoughts, my concerns, there was nothing vital enough for you. And I do say you guys, board president, superintendent, again, you're, this is your responsibility 
As a president, as a superintendent, you lead by example. You oversee everybody. You meet the child's needs. And that's why I say, don't pick and choose. Picking and choosing is not vital. Picking and you cannot pick and choose who you want to listen to. We've heard, like, there's been scandals everywhere with cheer. We just heard something happen at BC, sadly. VMA, every, there's problems. Why didn't we make it the, why didn't we take the initiative to ensure that that constitution is followed? Because that constitution is not followed. Your time and is at up. the end, it falls on it's you guys, and I hope Thank there is change. Much. Mr. Board President, yes, are, sir. Are we in between? Are we in between? I don't know if there are any speakers remaining, um, but I just wanted to step in and make a comment. Um, and yes, I know sir. that I just want to remind everyone in the audience of the the, the the instructions that the board president gives at the beginning of the meeting, um, and those are. And, and, I, and I've waited until there's no speaker present right now because I'm not trying to make this comment individual to anyone. Uh, just for the record, Mr. Water, we still have more speakers coming up, but just FYI. Okay. Well, I didn't know that, but and uh, the the point I wanted to make was um, I wanted to just make a comment uh, in the middle of the of the speaker, so that we're not individualizing this to anybody. And I think that the board, uh, you know, in the past has kind of erred in, on the side of just letting everybody um, say their piece, and we've certainly um, done that. Um, in the interest of, of allowing people to say what they want to say. But I just want to remind everybody of the instructions at the beginning um, that the comments um, towards anyone, uh, regardless who they are, uh, please uh, try to keep them uh, civil in nature, try to keep them courteous. Um, if you need to speak about somebody specifically or individually, I'm sure that there's a way that you can, can express your concerns, uh, which you certainly have a right to do. Uh, regarding the operations of the district in a way that is that's polite and civil um, and, and calm. Um, and again, uh, instructions are civil, courteous, uh, no personal attacks, and please uh, don't mention the name specifically of, uh, of students uh, or, or mention information that might uh, tend to identify a particular student uh, because there's a lot of uh, teachers at the different campuses, there are a lot of principals at the different campuses, and if you speak in those ways sometimes in a way regarding confidential information that's certainly not what the, uh, the open open uh, meetings are, are laws are for um so i just want to remind everybody of that thank you sir Um, I don't want my minute to start just yet because I have a question in regards to Weller. Where does it state that we're not allowed to say you all's his name? Like address President Moreno, Superintendent Cedar Yuan. Where does it state and on any policy that's lined up? I want to see where it does state it, that it, because it doesn't state specifically and so I can answer your question before you begin. But it does it does say it does say that uh, uh, comments or criticism should be civil and courteous. Correct. Uh, but it doesn't yeah. say that no names can be mentioned. And once again, that's getting into your First Amendment right. When we, when they go uh, to any meeting, they don't address, hey, Joe Biden. No, it's Mr. President Joe Biden. Right. It's direct, right. you know. And you, you can keep your comments civil, cordial, correct, respectful. And I get it. But once again, I, I look at it that, why can't I address Mr. Oscar Moreno, Medrano, why? I, I don't see there's anything wrong with that, it's as long as we keep it polite. I think us, uh, with all due respect, Ms. Palomino, uh, with, uh, you are correct as far as, I mean, we are public figures up here, so, I mean, when you address Mr. Medrano or you address, you know, and you do it in a, in a courteous manner, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. And, 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 you know, but as far as uh, uh, our students, students by name, no. No, I understand but, that. I get it because they're that, juveniles, you're, you're but everybody, and Mr. Weller just made that comment, and I mean, it's a lie, another lie that we go ahead and deliver to the, our community, which I don't, I think it's wrong. But Ms. Villarreal, what, what I was stating, and not to continue the discussion, what I'm stating is you may mention people, 
particularly board members, you could you can discuss people by name, but please keep your comments uh, polite and courteous. That's the only request. I don't think I've ever been disrespectful. What I consider disrespectful, you all consider it polite. It's vice versa. It's it's how the person wants to take it. But if the shoe fits, well, wear it, right? It's about perception, ma'am. So you're you're free to speak. Okay, and now you can start my minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want everybody to know that I don't pick sides. I'm not here to be friends with anyone. I never have. However you guys, your perception, how everyone views it, it's to each his own. So I'm gonna start off with my first topic, House Bill 2610. It's in regard to minutes versus daily attendance. Um, I read in, on that House Bill 2610 that it was passed by the 84th Texas Legislature and it amends the Texas Education Code 25.081 by striking language requiring 180 days of instruction and replacing this language with language requiring districts and charter schools to operate a minimum of 75,600 minutes. That's including intermissions and recess from the first bill to the last bill. That means that eight hours, our children attend school eight hours a day, equaling 480 minutes. Those 480 minutes multiplied by 180 days that our children should be attending school equal 86,400 minutes. San Benito does those 86,400 minutes. The state requires our children to attend 75,600 minutes, leaving us with 10,800 minutes to spare, equaling 22 days over the 75,600 minutes required. When those young students came and asked, why are we the only ones that start school early and the day late, they do have that possibility of having shorter days if you go off the minutes based by the house bill. Why do we get calls from attendance officers and letters in the mail that our kids are getting hit with truancy and we need to make up hours and days when if you look at it, we haven't passed, we have extra minutes that we go through. How does that coincide with our children's attendance? And how do you all figure that they have to make up hours and we get hit with truancy letters? The House bill also states that 120 minutes equal two hours, each day to be coded as eligible for half day attendance, and 240 minutes equal four hours to be coded as eligible for full day attendance. Why, why don't those same requirements apply to our high school students? I didn't read anywhere that the House bill applies for elementary and middle schools only. Are we gonna be going off of minutes or days to be hit with truancy, to be getting, to get those letters stating that our children have to attend classes to make up the hours or minutes? What are we gonna go off of, the minutes or is it gonna be attendance? That's a question that I have and that's something that should be on the agenda rather than just the bond, the, the construction, the construction. I'm moving on to my next subject, board agenda. We, I always see $40 million bond, construction, firing contractors, not enough funds, it's a blame game. For the past few years, I have seen the same topics on the agenda, which always lead to the new construction, which always lead back to the construction issues. And who do we blame, minority or majority? Try both, both parties. I only see one new face here, which is you, Mr. Gomez. So I can't even hold you accountable for it. But all the rest of you have been here and have done nothing but complain and blame each other. We the people, the constituents that put you here, put you there in those nice leather seats just want the truth, honesty from the board committee. Every month, in every meeting, our district always seems to redirect the agenda to the construction site. And in every meeting, I see our attorney, Weller, raking in the big bucks. And all he does, surprisingly for the first time today, he wasn't silent. He usually says, yes, no, maybe so. We criticize Nate and Orlando for paying Palacio to do nothing. Mr. Board President Ramiro and Superintendent Servillon, you both are doing the same with Weller. Instead of him sitting and listening to the usual rant, he should be filing against the builders, developers, or whoever did the error and has the construction at a standstill. Let Weller do his job, fight with the developers, 
That's what he gets paid for. Mr. President Ramiro and Servillon, do your job. Inform the district about the real district issues, bullying, harassment, policy violations, favoritism, corruption, grievance procedures, and the correct way to file complaints. Encourage all parents to read handbooks and the policy books, the code conducts, because hearing all these parents, there's nothing positive coming out of them. And obviously, I'm not the only one that brings up bullying. There's a lot of it going around, and it doesn't seem to make it to the board agenda. It's just the whole construction site. It was this party, and it was this party. It's not about that anymore. Once again, that's in the past. Crying about it is not going to bring the money back. We need to focus on issues, which is the children. My next topic, superintendent duties. A school superintendent oversees the daily operations and the long range planning of a school district, serving as a point person for all district matters. The role of a superintendent is to supervise school principals and district staff, work with school members and manage fiscal operations. Superintendents are charged with the overall supervision of the entire school system, including its schools, the teachers, principals, and support staff, and ensuring that all the school district policies are carried out as designed, which can be found in the board policy manual. And the BGA superintendent, your qualifications, duties that pertain to our district. I believe that our superintendent has felt horribly at her job. You might question how, what do you mean? You spoke so highly of her at one time. I do remember speaking so highly of you. True story, but then she showed me her true colors and has been so transparent ever since then. Engages into school politics, which is frowned upon. We criticize Nate for that. Rather than engaging with parents, with the parents whose children suffer from bullying or refuses to change the vaping policy system, violates board policies, allows teachers to break Texas educators' code of ethics, lies to parents and board members so casually that obviously means that she does it on a daily, covers up for juveniles who come from political clout. Judge Garza, if that's what you all are implying to, whoever I speak of, he had the opportunity this morning to tell me something. We saw each other face to face. Obviously, it doesn't bother him, so I don't see why it bothers you, Grace has her best friend, Teresa Cantuc, text me, but yet you didn't think I would piece together that part of the puzzle? Has her fish information out of me and has her friend convinced me not to attend tonight's meeting? LOL. You should have thought, you should have known by now, superintendent. I trust no one and always have my guard up. I found that a little crazy, but funny. You pulled a John Escobar move, a good one. It was kind of funny. I can continue with her unethical behavior, but I will save that for my grievance hearing. Following to the phone policy case study. San Benito Handbook, page 5152. Mr. Isasi mentioned he is following through a policy that was already implemented, which should have been done a long time ago. False. The district permits students to possess personal cell phones for safety purposes. Phones must be off during instructional day. Only because I don't have the instructional day definition, but that means when teachers are having that face-to-face -face interaction, which it's not done often as it should. Off is questionable, like ringer off or device off. Sign at the BMA states no phone while in office. Why? After every illegal issue and all their lies, administrators say along with the superintendent, children need to carry their phones at all times, especially where they're in the office due to the unethical behavior from the staff. Don't get me wrong, I agree that our children shouldn't have the phones with them while in class. It's a distraction and most importantly, it's rude. We need to show teachers respect and that it's by listening to them while they lecture. At our house, our rules are no phones at the dinner table and no phones on Sunday. What I don't like is when I'm lied and I don't like for them to lie to our kids just because the principal feels he's the adult with authority. I called the principal and asked him why did he lie at the meeting in regards to him getting any calls from parents about the phone policy. And he lied to you all. I had called him prior to the meeting. I mentioned how there was a rumor about an administrator who was in school going for his doctoral and part of his, of his final was doing a case study about technology and if children perform better with or without a phone at hand. 
He said he hadn't heard anything like that and he was going to do a study, but in another region. And if he was to do a study, it would be with Cervion's permission. I'm like, not just Cervion's permission, you need the parents and the students' consent. I'm sure Cervion is okay with our children being lab rats, but I'm not. She's okay with breaking the rules and lying to parents. Once again, I'm okay with no cell phone rules if the teacher is, be, is teaching. No cell phones while walking in the parking lot, crosswalk, or by the street. But don't lie and say that the no cell phone rule is in the handbook and assume parents don't read the handbook and dissect the article. To follow is my grievance. If what is a grievance complaint? Where do we file public parent complaints and who handles them? What is the process and the, and the time frame to file? How does the time frame work and who decides the district can drop the ball with the time frame and make their excuses justifiable and valid? What's the purpose if you're going to ignore the complaints by the time the excuses, by time and excuses for your reasons on forgetting to answer them? Why? How did my cousin's level two grievance complaint get on your desk at Avion? It's a level two, it shouldn't be on your desk. Last week I emailed the, com the committee and Weller on a grievance complaint to file on the superintendent. Only one member replied, my complaint should go straight to the committee, but you guys want to mess with policy when it's convenient to you. I heard the mother earlier, the first one that complained about her child being bullied. Right here I have March 1st where I filed complaints. April 6th, I came in for a meeting and they let me know, oh, it shouldn't be a level two. You have to do a level one. A month later? In the meantime, what's gonna happen to the child? How much more bullying do they have to put up with? How much more bullying do the parents have to put up with? It takes a lot for them to come up here. Y'all don't care to explain to the parents about the grievance, the process, when it's due what's supposed to go on there? It's not your kids, right? Why does she have to come up here, put her face here? You don't think they're embarrassed? You don't think we get embarrassed? I don't. And it's not my kids, but I feel it for those other kids. I feel it for the parents. I don't, I'm not here for friends. I'm not here to pick sides. But you guys are divided. And if you're not focusing on the grievances and things like this, what are you all focusing on? Because you're not calling back all the parents. You're calling selected parents, doing selective grievances. We're all equal. At the end of the day, you're not gonna take anything with you. But when you pick and choose, that's what bothers me. You could call up, you can call and change and amend a policy for UIL because it's a principal's daughter but you can't call a parent back in regards to bullying that's been calling and calling you and you're like, oh, I have a parent in front of me. I'm here to call your bluff. I know you make that face like, oh, like, oh, what are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. You know in regards to the JJAP, all these children vaping, you have the power, the authority to change a lot of these rules. But it's like you want to see your children fail. Your time is up. Thank you, Ms. Palomino Villarreal. I can't understand. She's got several. Our next speaker is Lupita. Buenas tardes. Voy a comenzar con español porque yo le he preguntado aquí al presidente y cada vez que le pregunta a Mr. Moreno, yo le he dirigido a él que si me deja hablar verdad en inglés, pero como voy a transcribir en español y me dice que no. Y no sé por qué es eso, porque hay muchas familias, verdad, que no saben en español, no saben inglés. Y yo por buena mente Quiero, verdad, que también sepan ellos, porque si él quiere ir, a, me dejaría. Y por eso ahorita voy a comenzar con español. Y esto se lo voy a dedicar a mi cuñado Alex. Alex trabaja aquí por la escuela y usted ser fuerte, 
pero para que sepa verdad la gente en San Benito qué clase de presidente tenemos y para que usted sepa y para que la gente sepa que él se llamaba Alex García y para que la gente sepa mi hermana era Fátima Huerta and this is Alex y pa, and a lot of people might be laughing right now but guess what nosotros somos una familia unida una familia fuerte mucha gente los conoce nosotros ayudamos cuando nos podemos y los preguntan, como ahorita. Yo he venido desde cuando comencé aquí, desde agosto, desde el año pasado. Y yo les dijía, yo necesito lo mejor, yo necesito los mejores maestros para los estudiantes. ¿Pero qué creen? ¿Tenemos eh, suficiente de maestros? No. ¿Qué están usando? ¿Están usando clerks? ¿Qué están sacando? ¿Para que uh, le enseñen a los estudiantes? ¿Están sacando... Substitute teachers, otras maestras que ni tienen el certificado y ya sé que no es culpa de ellas, pero de ellas están yendo para el colegio para ser maestros. Pero qué clase de superintendente tienen, acuérdense, ella es la que está encargada de la escuela, porque ustedes no pueden manejar, ustedes manejan a ella, ustedes manejan a la superintendente. Y aquí, Mr. Moreno, usted se la trajo, usted se la trajo para esta comunidad, Usted dijo que ella iba a ser un buen ejemplo de superintendente. Y si le hubiera una cosa, que en el test me dice que cuando quite a alguien, que ustedes deben tener una cara de derecha, ustedes no deben estar en el teléfono, ustedes me deben estar mirando y dando el respeto. Pero ustedes como miran, mira lo que está haciendo ahorita la superintendente, ni me puede mirar, ¿por qué no me mira ella? Le estoy hablando a ella. Y acuérdense aquí, comunidad de San Benito, ¿quién le paga a ella el cheque? Nosotros, nosotros los que pagamos taxas. Todo aquí, esta persona que está atrás, ellos pagan taxas. Y no se les olvide. Y usted debe respetar a la comunidad, mi servión. Como así aquí yo vengo, le respeto. A usted nunca le ha faltado el respeto. Nunca. La ha mirado, nunca le ha dirigido nada, nunca le ha sido cara. Pero esta es clase de la persona que soy. Your time is up on that topic, ma'am. Next topic. Can you tell me the next topic, please? The start test. Now I'm going to say it in English. The start test. Very important start test for our students. Like I said last week, you know, Dr. Um, McGee, you know, she's the coordinator, curriculum, I'm sorry, director. And she's the one that's in charge of this. But you know what? The overall is. Who's in charge? The superintendent. I've told you all from the beginning again. I've been forced to have better teachers, have what they need, the resources they need. Superintendent, where were you when these we needed teachers? You were already here, ma'am. You started in August. How come we didn't have enough teachers for these students? How come we, didn't, we were pulling out clerks? Well, we were pulling out substitutes. Some of them are going to college. These substitutes that we're having, they want to be teachers. But you didn't inside and you said, you know what? It's, up, it's on the principals. Let the principals take care of it. You want to you wanna go ahead and do that? How do you think these students feel when they have a substitute? They can only do so much. Of course, they give them for the weekly, they give them the whatever they have to do, their modules. And they teach. But when they have a question, and you already knew since August about the audit, how the scores were. You knew very well that should have been one of your priorities, the students. And you always forget the students. But if it has to do anything with an executive, or you're doing a new job for an executive director, let's get on the ball here. We need a new job. Hey, you know what? We need this executive. And let me tell you how much an executive is making. An executive is making 91,831, midpoint 100,000, 111,300, and max 130,000. But your chiefs? You wanna know how much your chiefs are making, community? They're making 113,868. 
the midpoint, they're making 138 and 023, and then 162 with 178. These are your chief executives, you know, and we're paying a lot of money. You know, we had directors here, and I had to go down and I had to go ahead and write it because I do my homework. But, oh, we have to pay them. With this money that we spent, you could have still had a director and you could have had more teachers. My focus was on these teachers that we needed for these students. How could you do that? And remember, you're paying the tax, you're using taxpayers' money. Your time is up on that topic, ma'am. Give me one second. Uh, can you, Ms. Lupita, can you come tell me what this is? The next topic, right, P? Okay. Principles, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Is that, is that together or separate? No, separate. separate? Okay. Tell me when. You may begin. Principles. We said to you one again, the beginning of the school year, we had a lot of teachers, I mean, principals being moved. The only one that can do that is the superintendent. And I feel bad for these students because guess what? In the long run, they're the ones that either they change the principals, they don't have a good connection, and one of the good schools that I can talk about is Frank Roberts. I will get credit, of course, to Ms. Leal and Mr. Diaz when they were there. They had that close bond with these parents and students. From an F to a C, what does that tell you guys? You know, they were making a progress, they were being productive, and they were being positive. The triple P's, and that's what we needed. Superintendent comes in, and she moved a lot of principals. She moved on, and that was one of the principals that they moved. Right now, Frank Roberts, they're in a hard time. A lot of these kids, you know, it's kind of hard when they have the connection. And you're talking about, you know, it's going to be over there by Camino Real, the trailer parks, and what have you, El Jardín. Everybody knows everybody. But once you have that change and you have a principal, because she was an administrator here, but you moved her. A lot of people think, no, she, no, superintendent moved her. And I'm wondering if you moved her so she can fail. That is my question to you. Why would you do something to, to that pr person if you already knew the connection that those principals had, Mr. Servion? Why would you move her? What was your justification to move two excellent principles that we had there for failure? Because they're having a hard time. And this is what you did. You did that, but you know who you heard it in the, long, in the long run? The students. And I can't wait for those tests. Because let me tell you, board, I want you to hold her accountable because you are the ones that are see over her. Because let me tell you, Mr. Moderna brought her in, but I want you to do the diligent job of seeing how the students are gonna come, the scores because that's on you, Ms. Arion. And I hold you accountable, because if these kids fail, it's on you, and it's a shame, because you're not hurting anybody else but these students. And can you imagine some of these parents? Some of these parents don't even speak English. They don't. So how do you know when you get something out? You know, it's like, what do they do? Pues, ¿tenía otra maestra? Pues, ¿quién sabe? You know? Next topic, ma'am. Teachers. Teachers. You know, I value teachers. I value all the teachers. You know, and sometimes they're put in a predicament where, again, they're moved. A lot of teachers got moved as well. Why did they get moved? And who can only do that? The superintendent. We have really, really good teachers out there, Ms. Serion. But sometimes when they're making these moves, and I know that Board members can't do anything because that would call migrant management. But you moved a lot of teachers. Oh, but guess what? Sometimes you think like, oh, you know what? Well, nobody's gonna say anything. I can move anybody. I can do anything I want. Well, 
they gave you the power. Mr. Moreno brought you in. Let's give you a chance. I gave you a chance, remember? I gave you a chance when you came to my house. I gave you a chance when you said, hey, I'm going to run. I want for better. Let me run. Give me a chance. Está bueno. Look what happened. But you, you know, and it's, it's kind of a shame because you're a very intelligent individual. But you know what? You don't have to be intelligent to be mean to somebody like this intentionally to move somebody, to make a teacher suffer. You know, maybe she's having a hard time. A lot of teachers didn't get supplies. They didn't get supplies. And who gets hurt? The students again. You know, and every time I come here, you know, and I'm not, you know, and I'm glad everybody has their comments and concerns, but it is what it is. And you just need to remember that sometimes you just need to focus on these students. Not on your personal agenda, not on your friends from San Antonio, because the majority you brought are from San Antonio. And I can tell you right now, you did. And this, we have excellent directors here in San Benito. We have excellent directors here in the administration building. They've been here for over 20 something years and they're still directors. You could have given them a chance, but no, you didn't. Who do we hire? We hire the ones you want, the ones you're gonna go ahead and say, you know what, I recommend these. I recommend the lawyers. I recommend the executives. And they're making good money. Just remember the taxpayers are the ones that are paying their checks. And it's sad, but this is where you have us now. You have some in a hole, because let me tell you, the grades weren't that good in San Antonio either when you left. You left it wrong, and let me tell you, I don't want this for San Benito. I don't want these for the students. They deserve better. And let me tell you, they will get better. Even if you're there or you're not there, I'm going to make sure that these individuals, each student, gets the proper education they need. Thank you, ma'am. Your next topic, does that say superintendent, ma'am? Yes. All right. Hold on just a second. Okay, go ahead. All righty. Superintendent. We got the superintendent in August, and when we got her, I was the only one that came to the board, and I asked, I asked, you know, I came with my concerns, and you heard me, but when you came back from the executive, I didn't see transparency. You didn't vote on it. I came the following meeting, and I asked, and I asked you, Mr. Moreno, I said, can you go ahead and please show of hands? I asked him because he's the board president and he's the only one that can say, go ahead and show of hands. Where was the transparency there? Me as a taxpayer? And I read on tabs B, and you should have given me that right, but you didn't. Because let me tell you, like right now, I'm talking and he's not even looking at me, but that's fine. That shows the character. You might be smiling, but that's fine, sir. I still respect you. I still respect you, you know, because that's the kind of a person I am. But you're more worried, you know what? You say, well, you know what? I don't have to show because I can hide. Well, let me tell you what happened. On May 12, I have two board members. And it was four more board member, Janie Lopez and Mr. Moreno. I'm sorry, Mr. Medrano. Y'all went to maintenance. And I have it right here. And I have the pictures where you left, you got there at 9.15, 9.10, and you see yourselves walking there, and you left Mr. Perez's office at 9.56, and then I see you going back through the back door. And you know what you call this? Micromanaging. You were already here, Servion. You let them do whatever they want. No, nobody's gonna find out. Well, no, I did find out. The sad thing about it, my husband was going through a grievance. By the time those board members came, you had a blue folder in your hand. You're not supposed to have anything in your hand. You know that's against the bylaws, right? You know you're not supposed to be with, with supervisors. That's against the bylaws too. 
Because what were you doing there? Micromanaging. No, better yet, stopping production. I don't blame those maintenance supervisors. I blame you, and I blame Ms. Servion. Because she knew about it. And I want you to go ahead and pass those pictures. Because guess what? I want you to hold them accountable now. I want you to report him to TASB. What is he doing on premises talking to employees? That's micromanaging. On that topic, ma'am. Your next one is audit. Yes. Audit. We had the audit, and I understand everybody has their point of views, and I have mine. What came out of that audit? Bickering, fighting back and forth, and what have you. What came out of that audit? I want to know if anybody got arrested. Did you take any money? Did you take any money? Did you take any money? Nobody took any money. Nobody took any keys home. But no, you all wanted to do the audit. $250,000. Let me see what we could have used that audit. Community, we could have used that audit. And I've said it from the beginning. And you all can go back to the tapes. It's nothing new. I've told you all about this bullying. I've told you all since Uvalde happened. I told you all. Didn't I tell you all? I came here. Alex's cousin got killed there. And I came and I said, you know what? Hey, you need to do something about the bullying. Anybody can come and something can happen. Looks what's happening. 250,000 for president? We could have gotten more security guards. We would have made them full timers. You only have like two security guards over there at VMA. But at the Cabasa, like three security guards. How many kids do you have in there? 600 and something. But no, you're not fine because guess what? They're not your children getting bullied. They're somebody else's children getting bullied. The, and what happened? And what happened? You know, I don't want to put that lady there, but it's sad. And it's a safety that's going on. And you've never put it on the agenda. And I've come time and you, anybody can go back. Anybody can go all the way back and see that I've always focused on the bullying. And you have not done anything to stop it. Superintendent, these are your schools. These are students. And you haven't done anything, ma'am. It's getting out of control. And board president, tampoco. You know, you say, you know what, and you get monthly, you get weekly reports. You can't say no, because let me tell you, sir, you get your weekly reports, and you have to because you're the board president. You, Mr. Vion, and Mr. Wheeler. So you know what's going on in and out every day on the hour. And for you not to do anything about it, but you went on this hiatus for this, with this audit, that money could have been utilized, like I said, for the security, the safety of these kids, utilize it for anything, the cheerleaders, whatever you wanted, as long as it was for the students. But no, you didn't want to. You had too much pride. You wanted to get somebody. What did you get? Nothing. Nothing out of this. Nothing at all. It was just the poor children that are still going through bullying, and that's sad. Time is up on that topic. Breach? Yes, sir. Breach. The breach is horrible, and you know, a lot of people had opinions, and I had my own. I had a granddaughter, black market. That's all I gotta say. Her information was exposed, and you let it happen. It was under you. You know, and it's a shame, and I'm gonna say his name, Mr. Todd English. I don't know why you didn't let him get his open grievance. Why didn't you let him? Ma'am, I'm gonna ask you to refrain from mentioning employee names. He's former Please. employee. He's no longer here. He's a former employee. Are you still referring no. to a, uh, it's still okay. a, a former employee? No, but still, he's a, you see how you are? Every time we say something, he's not, he's not an employee anymore. He's not. You're gonna argue with me? Okay, let me speak then. Thank you, sir. How come you didn't let him speak? He was gonna talk about the safety of these children. Children and other people. Can you imagine your information, your social or whatever? It still got what it still got breached. It shouldn't have happened at all. 
You know, now we have to call the IRS. Now we have to get a pen. That's something that we didn't have to do. But that's extra now that we have to do every time. Seriously? And let me tell you, Mr. Servion, you never spoke about how much money you got for those tablets. Whatever happened to that money? They got sold. What did you use that money for? You never said, and you never put it in the agenda back again. You have Ms. Lee Peña. She does IT because she did the presentation. And she's the top one. She's the one that knows everything. I assure you, there's safety. How come you never spoke about it again? Let the community know. Let them be aware. But what? No transparency. Oh, they're not going to ask. No. We have to now. The way you're running this district, you think we trust you with your children, with their children? Safety? That's one of the main concerns, the safety. Really, Ms. Edivion? Mr. Board President, I'm just going to interrupt. This just certainly feels like a personal attack that's no, going on right I'm now. sorry, I'm sir. I'm just asking you again, reminding you again. Yeah. To try uh, to, you know what? And it's kind of funny. Yes, sir. And you know what, uh, Mr. Wheeler? It's kind of funny because you're taking my time up right now. Miss. And wait, 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 wait. But it's kind of strange that a white Caucasian and a Mexican comes here. No, and it's true. And I'm Mexican, how do you think I feel? Because the other lady, well, it's Mexican, and he came. How do you think I feel now? You don't think my rights were violated? They've been violated before, you know that, right, Mr. Rion? Your time is up on that topic, ma'am. Moving on. Um, ABC? Yes, sir. All righty, ABC News. I have one here. It's very informative. You went on and said that it wasn't informative. Well, I brought one, because you probably, I don't know, but you misled and you misinformed the people. Of course, it's gonna have the superintendent there, and it's all in color, and it has all the information about the facility. It has the board members. It has the schools. It has here, Samanito says, farewell to legends. It has a lot of informative information, a lot. And it talks only about San Benito. That's what it talks. That's all it says, San Benito. Nobody else, as you can see, it's all San Benito, and it's in color. And you know what I like about this? That it's for two months, and then they give it, they send it out. Well, yeah, we paid $9,000, but it's informative information. Now. I had to call a local newspaper, and guess how much they have to pay for one page if you would want one? You want to know for one page only? $1,300. You have 12 pages here. If you want 12 pages, ¿cuánto es? Like $12,000. It's expensive. It's expensive. But yes, we did pay it, but guess what? In return, we got this back. We got all this information. And you put it on your Facebook, and you said, you know what, $9,000. Well, guess what? It's all about student. And what I like about it, it even gives you the calendar for the year. It gives you here for the star test. It gives you here for the assessment window. It gives you here all this vital information. Vital information. But you failed to tell these because you're running. You failed to say all this. You fail, you know what? They have to pay still their workers. They have to pay the print shop. They have to pay the color. And guess what? We get it for free back? Yeah. We still have to pay, but guess what? They have to pay the post, the postage. So guess what? Did we utilize it? It was utilized for a good purpose. So when you're out there, Mr. Moreno, saying things, not because that I'm saying you're wrong, but I have to correct you. And this is what it is. So the people can see. This is what it is. And if anybody wants to see it, I have it here so you can see it. So you can know when you're out there saying, you know what, this was not right because you as board president, you're advocating for Samanito, you're doing it the wrong way. You're doing it the wrong way and you're misrepresenting, I'm sorry, you're, you're not saying it right. Sorry about that, I got tongue tied. 
Your time is up on that topic, ma'am. I believe your next topic is, is it is this new lawyer? Yes. Okay. Lawyers. Uh, lawyers. Apparently, you know, we're paying a lot of money, but of course you have everything on board docs. So does everybody want to know how much they paid Big Staff Health Delgado? On December 2nd, 2022, check number 779238, they paid $24,620. Wow. And you can go into board docs. Now, what is not transparent, it doesn't say for what services. On March 2023, board docs, check number 781449, 22,000. 945 board approved June 21 for what services? But it, since it's $22,000, the board doesn't have to approve it because it's under 25 and who can approve it only? The superintendent. Anything under $25,000, remember my community, the, the superintendent can approve it. Yes, you don't knock your head, yes you can. Because when it's under $25,000, you're the only one can approve it. That's why they said anything over 25, then it goes to the board. And then the other one, it's Butchler and Associates PA. You know how much they've been paying them? $6,625. For what services? It says legal services, contract for school district. For what services? It doesn't say. But remember, here, they approved it. She wanted it, they approved it. They got a contract for two years, $5,000. If we see them, if we don't use them, $5,000. Oh, but if they come, guess what? We have to pay their flight, their meals, their hotel, and anything to do with them. Oh, and then if they come that day, otros $300. Vale. La hora. At an hour. And let me tell you, community, what do we get out of this? We pay for her, for her, the lawyers. But when we go get a grievance, can we use that lawyer? No. I've done grievances and I know firsthand. Grievances and I've done no firsthand. And I didn't have a lawyer. Too expensive. But guess how many lawyers they had on me? The first grievance, they had a one. Second grievance, another one. But at the third grievance, I had two lawyers against me. Two lawyers, but I couldn't use that lawyer. But I had, we have to pay those lawyers so they can have a lawyer. Okay, your time is up on that. INS? Insurance. Insurance? My insurance. This insurance, again, and I'm gonna be quick about this. This insurance, Mr. Moreno, you got this insurance? It was a quorum, sir. And it's a shame to say, but this insurance, it hurt my family. I still have a brother-in-law that got hurt on the job and he has to pay. Why would I have to pay? You know, and, but it's like, I had a brother-in-law that died. My sister Fatima, Fatima, everybody knows Fatima. Fatima's real nice. She went nine months fighting for that long-term check. Alex was in the hospital in Houston. And what happened? Nothing. You don't think this cost him stress while he was in the hospital worried? You know, we're not working. He has a daughter at home. Fatima's over there. You don't think that hurt him? Look what happened. He's no longer here, but you wanted that insurance. But you did go to my house, and I will say it again. You know, and there's, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame, Mr. Moreno, that you went to my sister's house. Knock the doorbell. We all have pictures, we all have cameras, but you couldn't go give your, your deepest condolence. 
That's the kind of board president we have. Oh, but it's election time? Hey, go vote for me. You went to my house. You said, you know what, and I gave you a chance. What have you done in return? Nothing. All you've done, Mr. Rion, is hired only the people you work with. And I am going to say, how many more minutes do I have right now? Ms. Servion, how many more minutes? 53 seconds. Real quick, on the, on the board meeting in October, we had Mr. Gallegos, and I want you to all listen. Mr. Gallegos, please. And guess what? That was about the plumbers. There was a question asked when we had the grievance. Mr. Oscar said, you know what, hey, if you can go and get a certificate, Mr. Benelli says no. But on the October meeting, you knew that he had already hired a plumber. When they asked the question and go back to the board meeting, and I want the board to look into this, he said, we only have plumber helpers. No, there was only two plumbers and two plumber helpers. And you know that is a fact. And he lied to the board, he lied to the community. Your time is up. Next uh, topic, time? Time. The time. I don't know why you want to cut the time. This is the first time that we've had like six or seven speakers. But if you go back, how many speakers have we had all, all the time? One, two, three at the most. But I guess I feel now that you want to cut the topic because guess what? We're speaking. We're speaking our concerns. And you know what, Mr. Moreno? I mean, you brought it back. Why do you want to now give us five minutes? I feel that that would be discrimination of our rights, to be honest. And I want everybody, because when y'all vote, I'm going to see that. Those are our rights. You're there for our concerns. There's parents crying for you. There's a lot of information. But y'all, you said yourself you were going to be transparent, and you have not been transparent, sir. Not when it's your personal agenda. And you know what I'm talking about. That day that I had a grievance, you went out there and you told me, I don't know what happened, Lupita. You don't talk to me. And I said, how could I talk to you? How could I feel like that, Mr. Moreno, when my husband was going through a grievance? And you know what he told me? I thought I had lost the worth of support. And I told him, you know what? This is not the time or the place. My witness is my husband. And I told him, this is not the time or the place. But this is the kind of person, a prison we have with his personal agendas. And let me tell you, instead of him saying, hopefully we can work something out, hopefully something can be done, something to say, you know what? Let's work together and see what can happen. No, again. The only thing he was worrying about was, you know, the support. It had nothing to do with it. That's what I'm saying. We need somebody here that's going to hear us out, our cries. And it's a shame. It's so a shame. And, you know, and it, and it is what it is. And I'm just appalled because sometimes it's like, I will call. I've sent each one emails. I have. That time that I came for the audit, we said, Avion, you got up and you didn't pick it up. That was a public comment. That was a legal document. And guess what you did? You turned around and you sat back there. Me as an individual, me as a taxpayer, how do you think I felt? How do you think I felt? Like, oh, you know what? She doesn't have to talk. She's nobody. Eh, who's going to listen? Who's going to say something? I will. Okay, your time is up. And then you have new chief tech. Yes. Give me one second. And that one's going to be on policy 21 on the new chief tech. Okay, so last week I heard that Mr. Gallo said that he's been looking around, you know, for the director. Now, he did say that other school districts, the directors do the E-rate, which would 
save $30,000. But then Ms. Servion said, Lee Peña used to do, be director and do the E-rates. I said, wow, impressive. But she goes on and says, you know, Mr. Garo says, there was already two individuals didn't qualify. We had two more, but you know, they don't want to get paid that much. Now, Ms. Servion said, well, one of them asked for $27,000. She said it straight out. Well, Ms. Servion, if you want to save money, it's my suggestion, right? I'm a taxpayer. Why don't you leave it as a director? Because there's a lot of young people or anybody. Right now, it's hard. And the directors here are getting paid pretty good. And I looked, and she can train somebody. Because if she knows her E-rate, we can save 30000 still. And she can train somebody for the E-rate. You have great people in technology. Save the 30000 have her train somebody, and still have that director position. You don't want that. You want that new technology. Now, I might be wrong. It's a guess. But I'm thinking that you might be thinking of moving maybe Miss Lee Peña there. Miss Peña is at 111,000. You said the magic work was 27. At a chief technology midpoint, it's 138,000 with $23. So I'm thinking she might say, well, you know what? Let's put Lee Peña here. We can make this because right now Miss Peña can't move because it wouldn't be a lateral move. Mr. Board President, I, I don't think it's appropriate for the Again. salary to be discussed. Well, you know what? The salary is the, on the web page. The salary is public comment, ma'am, but the, Lee Peña is our employee, so I'd ask that you okay. refrain from using her name. Well, I already did, so. Oh. so Thank you. Yes, but anyway, and uh, I lost my minutes there. But anyway, that is mine. So I'm thinking then, Mr. Cantu came in. You'll probably move him there into her position. I might be wrong. But if I'm right, that you might be thinking that because guess what, Ms. Servion? You really want to get all your friends. And you know what? That is favoritism. Mr. Board President, again, that's, that's, that's a personal attack. Okay. No, sir, it wasn't. I, I thank, it, thank, thank you, ma'am. You see? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weller. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the board president's remarks. So tonight I will keep my remarks very brief. I hope all our San Benito CISD staff enjoy their Easter holidays, spending time with those you hold dear. To our administration, teachers, and staff, star testing is but a few weeks away. Thank you for your hard work and dedication throughout the year. I trust that you have been provided the necessary tools that will help ensure the success of all our students. Preparing students for the STAR redesigned assessment has been a daunting task for all, but teachers have continued to embark on this journey with a positive attitude. Their efforts have not gone unnoticed. On behalf of the San Benito CISD Board of Trustees, I'd like to wish all our San Benito CISD students the best of luck on their STAR assessments and continued success in all their future endeavors. Okay. Yeah, I have it here. The next item on the agenda is item 4.2, Annual Report on Continuing Education of Board Members. So school board members must complete training that is required by the State Board of Education and the board president must publicly announce whether each board member has met their training requirements. So we have Mr. Frutoso Gomez with 17 hours. We have Dr. Ariel Cruz completing 15 hours. We have Mr. Mario Silva completing 50 hours. We have Mr. Orlando Lopez completing 13 hours. We have Mr. Oscar Medrano completing 40.5 hours. 
Ramiro Moreno completing 32 hours, and we have Mr. Rudy Corona completing 49 hours. Moving on, we go to item 5.1, superintendent's remarks. Mr. Bayon. A little longer than usual. And I'd like to address information that's been coming forth through some of our public comment presenters. There's been misinformation presented before. However, I deeply feel that I must address the severe misconceptions regarding our district processes. One comment made was that STAR prepares you for college. That is not the premise of STAR testing. So tonight, I would like to discuss what STAR test measures. STAR test measures that a student has learned and is able to apply the knowledge and skills at each grade level or course. Those are called the TEKS. The state assessment program is fully aligned to the TEKS, and so is the curriculum. There are three levels a student can achieve. Approaches, this level falls into the satisfactory category. Students at this level have met assessment requirements but are considered to meet the minimum passing standard. They will more than likely need interventions in the next grade level. Meets. This level was previously known as satisfactory, and students at this performance level have a likelihood of success. However, they may still need short-term targeted assessment intervention. And then there's masters. Grade level means that if you get a masters, you have succeeded to the next grade level and may need no academic intervention or very little. The board and I recently attended a team of eight training where we discussed our STAR data. At San Benito CISD, 35% of our students were either in the meets or masters category, 35%. So we know we have to do some work, but that work means true teaching and learning and not chasing test scores. That has been targeted and deliberate from day one. As we look at the high school, we are strongly focusing on students who need remediation based on multiple, numerous attempts on STAR. This is a whole other way of targeting students and ensuring that there is intense instru instructional support that only highly qualified teachers can execute. I would also like to address the insurance misconceptions. I'm sorry, misconceptions. Once an individual is not employed with the district, they no longer are active with our insurance, with our health insurance. It is no longer offered by the district. A former employee of the district will qualify for COBRA. COBRA's primary purpose is to prevent a lapse in health insurance coverage. COBRA is a law that allows someone who has recently lost their job to maintain their original coverage provided by the previous employer. This will only extend for 18 months. San Benito CISD's group insurance, our health plans, offers COBRA. That is an option for our employees. However, it's important for everyone to understand that since this person is no longer an employee of the district, the district's insurance plan no longer covers them. This is completely, COBRA is completely a separate program. Workman's compensation is also not part of the employee's medical insurance program. What is workman's comp? Workman's compensation provides medical expenses, lost wages, and rehabilitation costs to employees who are injured or become ill in the course and scope of their job. San Benito CISD's workman compensation plan is through TASB, TASB Risk Management Fund, and is not in any way affiliated, correlated, or connected to the district's health insurance plan, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield. The board has always placed our employees' medical needs at the top of their priority list. With an insurance plan that has been in place for three years, which is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Two years ago, 
The board also approved offering our employees voluntary supplemental insurance policies or benefits such as cancer policies, critical accident policies at a much lower premium, a much lower cost to our employees. If you have any questions regarding the benefits or there's any confusion at all of what we are providing employees and when individuals do leave, what coverage they would have and what necessary, necessary steps they need to take, please contact our risk management department. They will be able to walk you through the process and be very specific and even assist you in signing up for COBRA. Lastly, I would also like to address job responsibilities and titles. It has always been my belief that working as a cohesive unit with clear communication is the best way to get optimal results. As of late, I have brought in staff to fill in vacancies, recent current vacancies, because there was someone in that position before. These individuals have a varied skill set and can man an extensive number of tasks. Working together to get the job done so that our students have everything that they need at their disposal is our quest. Our quest. At no time do we let one of our team members falter as we all support each other. That is the system we are currently working under. It's a new system, but it works well for us. In closing, I would like our district staff to know that all decisions made are in the best interest of employees. And to our parents and community, please know that uh, the core of everything that we do here is to support our students, and that will always be our driving force. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your attention. And if you need any additional information, please let us know. Thank you, Ms. Arreon. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is item 6.1, Academic Health Report. Ms. Arreon. Yes, sir. So tonight I have Mr. Eddie Edisuris here with uh, Mr. Cantu that will go ahead and walk us through a presentation with a focus on the program that we have to ensure that we take the appropriate steps. It is gonna be correlated to bullying and also harassment. Can we check on the mics, folks? There you go. There you go. Thank you. Good evening, board members, President Moreno, Superintendent Cepion. Again, we are here today, uh, me alongside Mr. Edesuis, give you a brief presentation on bullying. Just over the past uh, couple months that I've been on board, uh, we've seen a lot of the reports that are coming across our desk or whatnot, and we feel it's very important for us to address what we have in place at San Benito CISD and some of the processes and what the definition of bullying is. So at this time, I want to turn it over to Mr. Edesuis. Good evening, Board President Moreno, school board members, Ms. Cervellon, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you all for this opportunity where we can visit with you all. More importantly, besides the processes that we have in place, which we're always looking at, and we're trying to make sure that it's something that's gonna work, something we can improve on, we're always looking at those things. But more importantly, we need to probably start with what is bullying? So just to give you all an idea, because sometimes people uh, look at it a little bit differently and maybe don't quite understand what it is, but just to give you an idea, and this comes from TEC, from Texas Education Code, bullying has to deal with, with an issue that could be a single significant act or it could be a pattern of acts. It exploits the imbalance of power, and that's very important to know because it, it would be one person either maybe physically um, imposing on someone that can't defend themselves or maybe verbally or written, or as you'll see in a little while, it could be by electronic means as well. A lot of times parents will say, well, my child's being bullied, but if the other child is also name calling, for example, or is also fighting, and that imbalance is not there, that's technically not bullying. So bullying involves written or verbal expression. It could be, as I mentioned, by electronic means. It could be physical conduct, conduct as well. It has the effect of being harmful to the student or damaging the student or damaging, damaging them emotionally or their, their property. It can be, if it's severe enough, persistent enough, uh, the action that they're um, using uh, creates a threatening environment. 
uh, it can be abusive to the educational environment, that would constitute bullying. And so it disrupts the, it disrupts the educational process. And it infringes on the rights of the individuals at school. So a little bit more on cyberbullying because you may recall that probably about four or five years ago, uh, David's law kind of came into effect. And so that was uh, sparked by Senate Bill 179 and was actually a student in Alamo Heights in San Antonio that took his life because on the outside, it looked like he was doing fine. But later on, the, the, the mom found out, the family found out after he committed suicide that uh, he was actually being severely uh, cyber bullied. He didn't tell anybody, and that's part of the problem. So cyberbullying is bullying, and it is just you know the, the source that they use. It could be their cell phone, it could be their computer, uh, social media platforms. So I, don't, I can't tell you how many parents we've talked to and we've told them that this has really become a severe problem. Cell phones and social media. So how do we try and eliminate that? Well, that's a huge problem. So instead of trying to eliminate that, what I've been working on, we've been talking about, is how can we use it, how can we use maybe the technology to bring about positive things? So I digress a little bit, let me go back to this. At the federal level, in order for it to be considered bullying, there's two things that need to happen. There needs to be an imbalance of power, and there needs to be repetition. And so you're gonna see that those are common in the state's definition as well. So what are the four main types of bullying? You have physical bullying. It might be hitting, pushing, shoving, intimidating the individual, damaging or taking something that belongs to them. It could be verbal or written, you know, maybe gossiping, name calling, uh, maybe picking on a personal characteristic. It could be social, relational, or emotional. That's damaging a person's social reputation. And the fourth type would be cyberbullying, which you just, we just talked about right now. It happens online. It happens through a mobile or an electronic device. So what, is, what bullying, why, or I'm sorry, what bullying is not? So we talked about what it is. What is it not? Were there some behaviors that happen? And th those maybe somebody will say that's bullying, and it really isn't. The first example is if it's a mutual conflict. So there's a, de uh, a disagreement, but there's no imbalance of power. They're both picking at each other equally. A single episode, because someone decides that they're having a bad day and they're gonna say something ugly to somebody, that's not necessarily bullying either. Here's one that's really important. I may not like you, but that doesn't mean that I'm, it, that's bullying. I mean, everybody, Possibly doesn't like everybody, we know that. What we try and encourage students through conflict resolution is you may not like each other, but you need to get along. And you need to start getting along here at school because later on, at work, you know, uh, in college, you're gonna run across all other kinds of people. So just a few more slides. Is it harassment? Because a lot of times we have people saying, oh, my student was harassed. Well, maybe, but it depends. If the bullying behavior also infringed on a protected basis, a protected class, and I have them up here for you all, whether it targeted race, color, religion, sex, age, disability, or national origin, that's when it's also harassment. If, if it doesn't include any of those protected classes, then it's not harassment, but it's possibly bullying. So how do we assess it? How do we know when it's bullying? Well. We have, Mr. Cantu, if you would please pass out the bullying checklist. And this comes from the Texas Safety School Center, which spearheaded all of these preventive measures approximately four or five years ago when they were enacted by legislature. So besides um, things like uh, school uh, targeted shootings at schools and, and uh, intruders, uh, uh, bullying, all of those things are uh, worked on by the Texas Safety School Center folks. So how do we assess it? Well, if you look at this checklist, it's a flow chart. And if you just follow it, it says, is it bullying? Well, it tells you right there, was it a significant act? Is it a pattern of acts? So if you check one, okay, then you move down to the next one. Is it by one or more students directed at another student that exploits, it, exploits the imbalance of power? Yes or no. And so later on, you'll see where it says that you must have at least one 
check mark in each of those sections for it to be constituted as bullying. So we look at repetitiveness. We look to see if there's an imbalance of power. We look at what type of bullying it was. We want to know what it results in. Does it result in physical harm, damage to their property? Does it uh, severely or persistently or persuasive enough that it's going to create an intimidative environment for them, a threatening environment for them, or an abusive environment for them? Is it materially or substantially disrupting the educational process? Does it infringe on the rights of the school? So we go by this checklist, we're covering all of those areas. And there I just put a little uh, hyperlink to refer to the Texas Safety School Center handout, which is the one Mr. Cantu just provided for you all. So now, is it cyberbullying? So the checklist, if you notice, also asks if it was caused by an electronic device. So we look at that. And then because of David's law, a lot of times it was kind of, well, it happened outside of school. If it's cyberbullying, and if it happens outside of school, the school can still act on that. And the school does act on that. Did it interfere with the educational opportunities of the student? As we remember David Mollick, which is the young man that the, the law is named after, remember the cyberbullying happened when he was away from school. So did it happen on school property? Was it a school sponsored event? Did it happen on a school bus? We look at all of those things. Lastly here, according to state law, if the act did not meet the criteria, it is not under the school district's authority. So there are other remedies perhaps in the, in the legal, on the legal side of the house. But we look at all of these things so that administratively we do what we're supposed to do. So bigger question, how do we stop it? I mean, I'm sure that you all can agree. I can remember when I was in school, and I tell kids all the time, how old are you? 13. You're not going to believe this, but Mr. E, once upon a time, was 13. And Mr. E had kids that would bully him. And I got into a couple of fights until I figured out that, you know what? I'm not getting anything by doing that. So it's been something that's been here. And I see some of you all kind of shaking your heads because, yes, I remember, or maybe in some cases we got so frustrated that we became the bully to others as well too. So it's a huge complicated problem, right? So how do we stop it? Well, you know what guys, it's gotta, it's gotta be a team effort. And that's why I have up there SBCISD, our, our educators, our board, uh, uh, under the direction of our superintendent, the leadership of our superintendent, our principals. We also need our parents because it's surprising how different parents react differently. I just had an hour and a half conference with a parent today. Mr. Cantu and I were working with this parent and the parent said, I, I tell my kids they are prohibited from fighting. I don't care what happens, they can defend themselves, but I don't want them hitting back or anything like that. And then I have other parents, as you well know, you can probably guess what they're advice might be to their son or daughter and more than advice I hate to say that sometimes they facilitate those negative confrontations with kids and outside of school I, that was kind of like wow so the other people the other group that I have here are the students you know as we go out to the classroom because I can tell you that we use stay away agreements uh, we do conflict resolution specifically. I'm talking about counselors. Um, bully prevention is done at the beginning of every year. There's a presentation on David's Law that's done. Uh, there's a bully prevention month in October where activities are done at the campus level. Uh, we use sand trait therapy, restorative circles, specifically Ed Downs uses restorative circles. Ripple effects at all our campuses. Uh, they have different materials that they've gathered throughout the year. They do core value lessons. They have group counseling, individual counseling. We have capturing kids' hearts. We do character counts, all of those things to try and get students to understand what consequences can come from these actions and what their decision-making should look like. Lastly, I have San Benito Community because it's for all, all stakeholders. So how do we get everybody together to try and see what more we may be able to do. Because interestingly enough, here are a couple of stats. More than half of bullying situations stop when a peer intervenes on behalf of another student. 
hey, uh, leave Mr. Cantu alone. I, I, I don't want to see that again. The next interesting stat is that when parents, school staff, and other adults in the community, they can help preventing bullying by talking about it, by trying to create a safe environment, by creating a community-wide bully prevention strategy. Lastly, school-based bullying prevention programs decrease bullying by up to 25%. And in discussions with people and even our superintendent, that was really interesting because a comment was made, wow, even if you have a prevention program, it will only decrease it for up to 25%. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? No, we'll do it anyway. Okay, so as we wrap this up here, like other school districts across the state and nation, we're not immune from instances of bullying. Statistically though, we fall below reported averages. Why? Because our kids sometimes don't wanna say for, for fear of things happening. So our incidents continue to be reported to teachers, administrators, parents, and by law, anonymously through the district Stop It application. And so I have what Stop It looks like. They have a mobile phone app. They can use the computer too. And I would have put the link for everybody, but I want everybody to know that each specific campus has their own specific uh, barcode where they can access it or a link. And that way, the Miller Jordan kids, we know it's, it's the reports coming from there or Sullivan Elementary or what have you. So there's a lot to talk about. There could be an entire class on this, but I'm gonna stop now and just say thank you and ask Mr. Cantu to join me in case you all have any questions. Yes, sir, I got yes, a question. Sir. Oh, sorry. Oh. Thank okay. you, Mr. Lopez. I have a question. Uh, do we keep uh, a track of numbers of the amount of bullying in San Benito School District? That's a very good question. You know that TA requires us to keep track of those numbers and they track certain things like how many reports were made, how many were actual threats, how many were not. And so our principals know what those questions are. It used to be that the state would ask for that information in November for the previous school year, but now what they're doing is they're asking in June for the current school year. So yes, we need to keep track of those numbers. And what are those numbers? I wish I could tell you right now. Uh, I can find out for you. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, uh, last year uh, when we submitted numbers, it's, it depends on the campus. I don't want to go on a limb. I have an idea what the number is. What I can tell you, because I look at it uh, more, more uh, regularly, is our Stop It app. Like we've had since the beginning of August until, August, until April the 4th, 152 incidences that were reported. Now keep in mind, Stop It started because of bullying to report that, but it's expanded. It's expanded to other situations where a student feels that there's a problem. I have one more question. Yes, sir. You say that we fall below. Uh, where, where do we fall anyway? Like well, it's statistically, and it's some information that I did not uh, uh, provide, for example, one out of five students on average are bullied. So if you look at our numbers, if we have, let's just say 10,000 kids, you know, that you're looking at one out of five, you're looking at 2,000 students. Yet we have 152 reports. You see what I'm saying? So why does that happen? Again, hey, I don't want kids to know that I'm squealing. Because even though Mr. E and other educators will tell people, or, or students rather, hey, forget about this snitches get stitches stuff. That's still the big thing. And so I try and get them to trust us that we're not gonna throw them under the bus. We have other ways to tell students, for example, hey, listen, I need to talk to you. Is there anything you need to tell me? What do you mean? Well, I saw some video in the cafeteria yesterday and I noticed X, Y, and Z. They don't need to know that I heard from other students, okay? But that's one of the big things they, they hesitate to tell. This young man this morning with the mom, he didn't even wanna tell the mom because he didn't wanna worry the mom. Do we follow up with the students like a weekly, daily? Well, I haven't even shared this with the superintendent, but uh, there were a group of six students, five students, uh, at one of our campuses, and I worked with the counselors and the administrators to do a conflict resolution. 
uh, for something that had been happening with some of them for over four years. So we met with them right before Easter break. What I haven't shared is that yesterday I contacted the counselors and um, we're gonna meet with those five students on Friday and I'm gonna provide some pizza and some drinks so that we can just follow up. It, it, what I found is that they wanted to talk. They didn't wanna go back to their class. They wanted you know, to talk about things. So I just wanna let them know, hey, we haven't forgotten about you guys. You know, here we are, let's talk. I hope things are going better. If not, is there something that's happened that you need to talk to each other about without arguing about it or getting out of hand? So we are following up. Thank you, I just wanna say one more thing and I'll yes, let somebody sir. else speak. It is very important to keep track of these kids because I was bullied when I was a kid. Yes, sir. And I know the feeling. Yeah, I was six and, years and, old. And so was and I. It kind of saved me, I still remember that. Yeah. So it's very important to keep yeah. these children safe, our students safe, yes, and sir. to make sure that we are following up with any uh, concerns that they might have, and also with the parents. Was That's, that a public school, Mr. Gomez? That was a public school in West Texas. The reason, <laughs> I, ask, the reason I ask is because I, I went to a Catholic private school, yeah. and I can tell you the name to this day of my bully. Yeah. So it stays with you. Yeah, like now, you know when it stopped? When another student that was bigger, said, hey, you leave Mr. E, well, you leave Eddie alone. <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly what happened with me. Yeah. Another student, of, of older student, stepped in for me right. and stopped there. He never and, bothered me again. And I can tell you his name too. And I saw him maybe about 20 years later. And I said, hey, I remember this. And now that I understand, I want to say thank you. So Thank yes. you so much. Appreciate no, no worries. it. No worries. Mr. I got I got it. Go ahead, Mr. Lopez. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, that was a great presentation. I, I think it's uh, it's very obvious. It's extremely, extremely important uh, to educate our parents, our community, and right. our, again, our kids more importantly. But you know, uh, you know, I think, in my opinion, as a parent, okay, uh, I can, I can, I can understand. I'm a parent of a seventh grader, so I can understand how the changes and all that stuff go on, and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think what we need to do is, you know, I think we need to have or focus on another stronger approach. Okay, for our customers, which are our parents, to send our kids here. So if our kids don't feel comfortable talking to our educators, don't feel comfortable talking to our police officers about what's going on, because maybe they might not understand what bullying means. Mm -hmm. You understand? So, mm -hmm. so the thing is, it's very obvious here on the on this uh, on the presentation. You know that it's a vast, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, expression of what bullying can be or what bullying is not. Right. You know. So, so you know. I mean, uh, I, I think it just. I think we need to, you know, refocus on that. Okay, uh, uh, you know, that's this whole bullying stuff is, of course, it's dear my heart, why? Because, you know, our kids are very important. And just, just to know that they're afraid of coming to an educator when they feel like they're, they have questions, uh, that's a major concern to me. You well, know, so, so if, you know, if, if we need to, you know, um, um, once again, you know, I'm not saying that we're not doing it. I mean, there's a plan in action and, like, you know, and everything that we're doing here I think is great. But I, I think we need to re yes, sir. revisit this all again and say anti-bullying is anti-bullying. That means we're not gonna tolerate it in the school at all. So right. the parents need to understand exactly what it means, the kids need to understand, and the staff need to welcome it and, and, and really address it because it, it's very important. Right. And, and I just wanted to say that we yes, have sir. a great uh, event coming up with parents great. where we're working because this is a team effort. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I know yeah. I've been the one here, but I mean, this is a team effort, you know? Right. And so Mr. Gonzalez with family um, uh, engagement, engagement yes, sir. you know, there will be a uh, symposium on mental wellness and on uh, safety. Mm -hmm. And so a round table was held with parents today at Landrum and some of those parents specifically talked about bullying. Now what I'll, I, I work with, the, with some counselors after they're off contract during the summer for a couple of weeks. The areas of concentration in the past have been things like the super PAC, have been things like the scope and sequence, the curriculum, but now what we'll be doing this summer will be specifically vaping and bullying included to the list. But great, it'd be nice if we can do like a, like a, like a mass press release as far as that's concerned of what we're gonna be doing to make sure that we have safer schools. Yeah, a lot of people don't know. Okay. That's why we wanted to make sure that Right, we, so that's, that's why I'm bringing sir. it up. Yes, yes I'm, a, I'm a parent, so I wasn't, I wasn't you know. Yes, sir. You know, so. so can so I Eddie, Eddie Sudis, uh, a question on that stop it. I know that we have, uh, we have that plan in action. I mean, and we do have it available, but how and when are parents informed? How and when are students informed? Is that something that's accessible, accessible to them on a daily basis? I, and also, uh, I, I, and I, I mean, we have a different program, so, but it's very similar, I'm sure, as Correct. Stop It, but 
So when the parent or the student or whoever does the anonymous uh, report, so who does that report go to? Does that go to the, the, the campus administrator? And then one, and then I'm, I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but sure. in order for students to make that, or whoever's gonna make that anonymous uh, report, do they, they must have that app, or, or can they just uh, use a, the QR code, or how does yeah, that work? Yes, they have a QR code that's provided, you know, and they can uh, download the app on their phone, and that's part of the presentation that's done every year under okay. David's Law, but they also are told that they can go on a computer and they can access it online. But yes, Ms. Servion. Mention the statistics, because they may think there was 152 incidents, and there wasn't. So some of the stuff that's reported is not bullying or it's like a false claim because what happens is the principals go back and check. And so they're checked, and I don't want you to think there was 152 situations because there wasn't. Yes, what is reported to the state is what goes through our Skyward system, which ends up being the whole process going through the referral. That's the statistic that gets reported. So these are investigated, but then it comes to the point where once it's done, those are the ones that are getting reported. So. I don't want you to go right. away with the impression or anybody that 152 situations transpired. I believe if... Uh, I, right, it's, it's anonymous, and sometimes right. we get things that are like, I don't know how to say it, super bogus. You know what I'm saying? It's just like something somebody writes on there, and then sometimes, it, like he said, it's not bullying. Mr. It's something else. Mr. Edisoris, I want to thank you for your, your approaching it directly, and you mentioned all the organizations that are out there, and I'd like to stop it, because that's... Very important. Right. Well, I appreciate that, you know, but I, I want to tell you again, counselors are doing, they rock and roll. I mean, they're really out there in the front lines, as well as the teachers, the administrators, and people here at central office. You know, Mr. Cantu, I don't know if you want to chime in here, but it's a team effort. I just wanted to kind of conclude on the, the process and the system portion of it that we do to assist our campus administrators, because like Ms. Edmond mm -hmm. said, the reports come in, but what happens to that report? We do have all our documentation, all our forms available to all our campus administrators so that way they can follow that process. It's actually on our website under Student Support Services Anti-Bullying. You'll see all the documentation, all the forms that our principals, assistant principals have available to them and the letters that need to go out if there is a perpetrator, a victim, the stay away agreement. It's all available for all our campuses to use as soon as that report comes in. Uh, so uh, it is there. We're looking into those forms, making sure they're good for our campuses to use. Yeah, they're usable. Yep. Yeah. And the Stop It also, the Stop mm -hmm. It app can be found on the schools, each individual's a website in case the students or the parents want to have it. And again, lately we've been getting calls by our principals just asking for that support and that's what that's what we're here for. Mr. So Cities, I want to go ahead and thank you for, like I said, what you've been doing when some of the parents have come up for public comment and they brought this bullish, bullying issue to us. They do mention that you have always made yourself very accessible. And we, as a board, we appreciate you being that source for our parents. Well, I appreciate that, but I gotta tell you that I just get lucky. <laughs> I get lucky, you know, that I'm here and that I'm entrusted, you know, like by our superintendent to be able to do that, and also by my supervisor, which is Ms. Lee Pena, that they entrust me to do that. But you know what? Mr. Cantu is involved as well, too. And then, of course, if it's an appeal, there's a committee that's involved. Thank you so kindly, but I'm just lucky to be able to do that. <laughs> and I want to express, too, because I personally, I feel that more bullying issues come to light in the secondary campuses. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of our counselors at the secondary campuses are tied up with schedules and academic counseling and things like that. How much of their time do you, would you say they are not allowed, but they get to yes. dedicate to right. this well-being, this mental health? Yeah. counseling well, for our students. Well, part of Senate Bill 179 talks a little about the 80-20 rule, which you may have heard. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ms. Servion or Jan mentioned, hey, what about the 80-20 rule? So what's happened in the past is, you know, it's been kind of hard to get those logs in from everybody to kind of see what they're doing, what they're not doing. Uh, but this year, uh, we purchased a, a program called SCUDA. And SCUDA actually will track what they are doing. And the, the thing is, the counselor's got a demo and I asked them, how do you feel about this? Hey, Mr. E, this is something we can really use. It's not give, you know, taking a lot of our time to do this. So I'll tell you what, at the end of the year, I can provide you all, if you all want, that information. Because one of the things that sometimes we hear is, well, that's not a counseling duty. 
Well, keep in mind that if you look at 20% of the time, if you're looking at a five-day work week, that's basically one, one day, day where you can do non-counseling type duties, okay? So, but what I can tell you is that we continue to encourage, especially at the secondary levels, those psychoeducational classroom presentations on a variety of topics, as well as let's get the parents in, work with your principal. You will hopefully get some parents there, and we can talk about things like conflict resolution, communicating with your child, decision making, goal setting, substance abuse, you name it. There's a lot of things that we could do to help. And I know we have those lead worthy classes in the middle schools. That's Are, correct. Is there an anti-bullying component to those? They talk about uh, bullying, they talk about uh, their health, um, they talk about a lot of those issues that you know are affecting them right now, but I think that this summer we'll have a better opportunity to kind of sit down and say, okay, what are we really doing, for example, with vaping? Because that's become a real big thing. Right now I can tell you that we have an intern from one of the universities, and he, it, it, he was assigned to a middle school to provide vaping presentations mm -hmm. to the students that are there. Uh, and speaking of middle school kids, you'd be surprised when I tell them that if it's a, a vape pen, they might, you know, they're going to have consequences, you know, PRC, what have you. But if it's THC, our hands are tied and they end up going somewhere else and they tell me we didn't know. So, uh, you know, as we continue to uh, inform kids, parents and everybody, I think that'll get a little bit better. As a board, I think we really need to look at what your suggestions would be to make this information more accessible and more consumable for the parents and the students, mm -hmm. because I really feel that we need to educate our entire community on, just, just like you said, if it's THC vaping, it's out of our hands. Yes, That's something completely taken over by other, ent ent other entities yes, and things like that. But we need to do a better job of getting that information to our community. Absolutely, and I want to assure you all that when we look at things, because it's, this is not just what Mr. E is saying, but it's brought to, I bring it to a committee of counselors, and then I bring it to all counselors to see how they feel about it. But it, it's, it's evidence-based and it's research-based. It's not just let's grab this program and do this. We want to make sure that there's some research behind it saying this is a good approach to be able to do this. We also rem remember that not one size fits all. So we may work with this, for, and it'll work with some kids, and we do this over here because it's going to catch some of those kids that this didn't work for. So we try a variety of ways to do it. I'd also like to say, uh, quit, like you said, at a certain point, it becomes more on the penal side of the house. Yes, ma'am. And it's a state mandatory you know, expulsion. So Mr. Cantu and I have gone out to JJEP two different times, mm -hmm. uh, looking at our MOU, talking about our kids, talking about the 90-day process versus now they will do a 45-day 40 day review. review for us and a 45-day process. And so uh, we, there has been some inconsistencies, but what's important to note is that I've talked, I think, at nauseum with Mr. Cantu about the fact that we need um, to put some information out where parents understand that at a certain point, when you look at chapter 37, it becomes a state mandatory expulsion. And then you go before a judge and the judge is the one that makes the decision. I know that there's a misconception that the school district can bring a student back, that the school district is the person or the entity that's decided how many days are there, and that's not it. Also, once they go into JJEP, there are certain parameters they have to abide by that can either lessen or extend their stay. And that's the way it works. So I think that that's something that's really important because there are, there's a confusion or there's misconceptions. And then I think also on the inequity of implementation, even with JJEP on their side, and Mr. Cantu was there with me when they themselves had misconceptions and misinformation and they pretty much owned it and said like, you know what, we were wrong and we're gonna rectify the situation. So, I mean, there's information that needs to go out, mm -hmm. but we had to go way back to the entity to get it straightened out. But I agree with uh, getting it out to our parents so they really understand the process and the ramifications because there are ramifications for certain actions. And so, um, I guess at the end of the day, we want to do whatever's best for our students, mm -hmm. but we also know that there's other students and it's not, we don't have the luxury of only thinking about one or two. When you're at the high school, you're thinking about 2,000. Yeah. And when you're at the district, you're thinking about 9,300. So.
Yes, ma'am. Mr. Yee, I got a question real quick. Um, this yes, will be the last, the last question. Does our police department get involved with presentations? Uh, with the kids? Yes, sir, as far as the anti-bullying and stuff uh, like I'll that. I'll tell you that I do know that some counselors will ask the police officer to come on board. And one of the things that we've been advocating for, I know that when I've spoken to some of the people that deal with these issues, the administrator or the counselor specifically, is to bring in that SRO, the security resource officer, so that once the counselor or the administrator's finished was telling them about what the consequence, consequences may be administratively, and then the officer can say, by the way, you know, there may be also legal issues, legal consequences, and this is what those things look like. Right, I think it might just be an addition. Yeah. I mean, we, we already have that resource for us. You right, know, so, so yeah, they know. do They do uh, team uh, Absolutely. Uh, approach, yeah. they take a I team mean, approach to it. Correct, that, that's a good, okay, yeah. thank you. Mr. Appreciate Gant, it. Mr. Gantu, Mr. Eddie Suri, thank you. That was a great presentation. Appreciate thank that. You. Thank you so thank much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eddie. And Mr. Gantu. Next up, we have item 6.2, construction update. Ms. Arreon? Uh Yes, tonight we have uh, Mr. Alex from ROFA here that's going to be walking us through some of the information as far as um, building placement. And I know I also want to hand it over to Mr. Weller because we have uh, Mr. Workman that's also going to be assisting us with a portion of the presentation. So, Mr. Weller, do you want to go ahead and commence with Mr. Alex from ROFA? Yes, ma'am. Sounds good. Okay. We're ready for you. Very good. Um, good evening, uh, Ms. Sevillon, uh, Mr. President, and members of the board and the audience. Um, let's see. Three weeks ago, I was here speaking to you all about uh, an issue that we observed out at the construction site, um, and I asked for you all's patience to investigate those findings, um, we, and, and graciously you gave us that time to do that, we, we brought on a independent civil surveyor, not associated with the construction of the project, to come in and look at where the placement of geo peers were in relationship to the building, and also to show us where the building should be sited versus where it is today. And so, uh, without further ado, I do have Ivan Garcia, PE. He's out of Edinburgh. He's with Rio Delta. Uh, he's going to give us a brief presentation. Some of this you've already been told, uh, generally speaking, in your building committee meeting a couple of, uh, maybe a week ago, uh, last Tuesday. Um, and there was generalities spoken. We're going to try to get into some specifics. And um, he sharpened his pencil over the week, too, and, and uh, has more specifics about what, what was observed and what we found out there. Okay, so I'll just let Mr. Ivan. Hi, uh, good afternoon, uh, board, and I guess uh, uh, everybody here. Uh, my name is Ivan Garcia. I'm a professional uh, registered land surveyor. And like Mike was saying, we did a preliminary investigation first. Uh, with some uh, site work, right, with, uh, I guess, um, replicatable, replica replicatable standard pro surveying procedures to make sure that the building was, one, in the right location. But the important thing here was there was a suspicion that the geo peers which support the building, uh, which should sit right exactly on the foundation of the building where I guess, shifted a little bit or misplaced from where it, uh, their intended design location was. So uh, we prepared some exhibits. I'm not sure if you have them in your packet. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through the exhibit just for reference, and then I'll, I'll go over the specifics. So uh, we had our survey crews uh, starting doing some field work about a few weeks ago, right after you, I guess, gave the authorization to uh, Rafa and, and Mike to start this investigation. So we had boots on the ground, and in conjunction with the contractor, they exposed some of the geo peers that were still outside of areas where the slabs were not poured, which are really the only ones that we could, I guess, get to physically. So in conjunction with them, uh, we identified some uh, key locations of, or peers throughout the foundation structure 
that would allow us to establish a grid because they're all in a grid pattern, right, by design, and we can align them and compare them to the as-built condition of the building, right? So what you see on this exhibit is uh, the green line that you see, it's the actual as-built location or projected as-built location of the building. Why do I say projected? Because, for example, in the example of the natatorium, which is the one that we're looking at, there's only an area on the west that it's currently built, right? So everything else is just a projection, right? So what we did, we aligned the design outline and foundation plan to those as-built locations that we found on the ground, and then compared those locations where the geopiers should be, right, to the actual locations. So specifically on this corner, um, and if you could zoom in a little bit more, if, if, if you don't mind, you can see the circle with the number 45, I believe, right? That's supposedly, the, that's the proposed design location of the geopier, right? So what we found, and you can see the point to the right of the screen where it has the arrow in red, that is the actual location of the geopier. So you can see there's a discrepancy in both directions to the south or about 1.83 feet and to the east of the intended location, which would be the center of that circle with the 45 of about 1.72. That's just one location. Uh, we, if, if, I don't know, Mike, if you could move to the, let's call it the southeast corner or the one further to the south. So Mr. Garcia, so that's yes. just one of the GOP. That's just one. Okay. See, and that was not an indication that all of them were wrong, right? We needed to pick up more to try to establish that grid pattern, pattern, right? And we are under the assumption that all of them were done as per the design, but just in the shifted location, if anything, right? Sir, I got a question for you. So as far yes, as sir. this concern of this inspection, who's the one that brought this inspection, inspection to light? Uh, I'm not sure the specific of who actually discovered this. I was brought into the picture after the fact. So we have Davila in the audience. Mm -hmm. So at any given time, can we ask them a question just to get clarity, just for transparency mm -hmm. on every, all the parties at, at B, please? I will say that we were the first persons to observe the discrepancy. And who's we? ROFA Architects. Okay, so you're saying that you did an inspection and found this? Did not do an inspection, an observation. Okay. We're out there every two weeks. Okay. And so we observed it. We've d observed discrepancies in the foundation for a while. But the most recent ones that gave us concern were... When okay, so when you mention a while, what does a while mean? Because since I back in March of 2022. You found a discrepancy? You found a discrepancy? Okay. Yes. Okay, yes. so when, why wasn't it addressed then? I don't know. I don't know why y'all weren't notified about that. I can't explain that. Okay, so we have Dawila in the audience. Can somebody come, uh, please, come to the podium, please, and address these issues? Because it's he said, she said, every single meeting. So can you please get, put a little bit of clarity to this whole situation, please? Uh, you want? Tony Vargas. Tommy Canul with Dawila yes, Construction. Uh, if I can shed a little bit of light on this and trying to go back in time. I, um, please, thank you, sir. There's a process that actually started here in 2020, and that started with another firm that has designed the civil package, which was removed from our contract in some form or fashion recently. The documents that they furnished to us were electronic, specifically in a format that we cannot use as contractors. I don't know that ROFA can use them electronically, but the purpose is for surveyors to share electronic information to then use GPS technology to locate things. I think in some form or fashion we have mentioned to you that there's hundreds of piers beneath both of these foundations. Those were located based on a document furnished to us, which was in turn furnished to a licensed professional surveyor, not Mr. Garcia, but a different firm. The subcontractor that the, those were located by a surveyor, the contractor from out of state that came to do the geo peers simply went to every single uh, I will call it uh, location that was that was established set their equipment drill the peers fill them up created these geo peers now they're not concrete just very briefly they're not concrete peers they are compacted caliche if we want to make it very a very generic description as to what they are 
and they're built up as you come up. Now at some point they have to reach a, a point to stop and then when we go about with the next subcontractor building the foundation, they cut the tops of those off in some form or fashion to get to where we can pour a slab. I, I cannot specifically tell you, I'd have to go back and look into March of 2022 as to what that first discrepancy that's being mentioned, but I do recall that we talked, we did bring up, hey, are we sure this is in the right location? And after some just general field studies, we determined that we did not have any issues. And who did you bring that up to? We actually brought it up to ROFA. We, we, we discussed a drawing and we said, can we just confirm something about these drawings? And I think all that went well, generally speaking, and, and we proceeded. So I don't okay. give the thumbs up to go ahead and start building right where, where those GOPs are at. Carter. Well, I, I won't, but, I, I won't but stand. But that wouldn't be ROFA's job Well, I, I won't stand here and say that ROFA gave us a thumbs no. up. What I would say is that we collaborated with oh, the design you. team to simply confirm, because they shared the same concern. I think once we voiced it, I think they may, they may have come out and voiced the same concern. We did some studies and said, no, 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 we're good. It's not an issue. We're fine. And I have a we question too. Mm -hmm. Peterson was your subcontractor that did the GOPers, right? They installed them. Uh, they, yes. they, to install right? them, right. So that was your subcontractor, however, right? That yes. was. Peterson is our subcontractor. I just want to make sure because I went back to look at everything all the way back to March 22, because that's when I first came in. I think it came out on the 21st. And I wanted to make sure I understood it because I don't want um, for us to, you know, start, you know, we all have certain contractual obligations. I don't mm -hmm. want to discuss them out here because mm -hmm. we'll get into some other gray area right. we shouldn't, right, Mr. Weller? But we I, all have agree, contractual I, obligations. Go ahead, Mr. I, Weller. I don't think this is the point of time for, for the contractor to come in front of the board and and Correct. give its version of events. I think that can happen. Well, there's a lot of Agreed. things that have been said. Uh, through, their own, through their own, through their own methods. Accurate, and, so we you know, need to defend ourselves. So you are really starting to dip. Right now, we're really starting to dip in the sort of a Again. legal debate or a contractual responsibility uh, debate. I do need to say something. And the district is never allowed. Uh, vendors of the district. Will you allow him to finish, sir, please? So, Mr. So, so Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Weller still has the floor, please. Oh, I thought you were telling me. No, I'm talking to him. Excuse me. No, no, I'm just true. saying, you know, we've never, in circumstances like this where we're examining, you know, a potential issue, we've never allowed a contractor to come in front of the board um, and, and uh, you know, in this type of fashion. If, if, if we're going to have a discussion about where we are and what we found and, um, and what the potential corrective steps are moving forward, you know, I can understand getting some feedback from the contractor, but if we're going to have a legal debate or you know, a responsibility debate. Um, I don't recommend that that, that occur. No, Mr. Witter. I, so I'm going to make myself clear, Mr. Witter, because I'm the one that asked him to come up. I saw him in the audience, and I don't know if they were asked to be here or not. That's not my duty. My duty is just to make sure that we, we get clarity in this whole situation because it's always been, you know, not having all the parties here at one time to speak about what's going on in these projects. It's always one sided, in my opinion, it's always one sided. Okay, as you will know, so I just asked them to come here and, and just clarify the situation of how we got from point A to point B to where we're at now. So I'm not asking them to talk about any legal issues because I don't know if there's any. We haven't been, I haven't been uh, prepared there's to that. There's contractual issues, sir. Okay, so, okay so, so anyway, so contractual issues or whatever. So that, that, of course, is not here for discussion. What's here for discussion is how did we get here? And that's all I'm asking. Very simple questions. How did we get here? We'll give you permission. We got the architect here that designed the building. Okay, so how do we get from 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 the the project manager, the architect, to the to the contractor, and now there's these issues in between, and it's I'm I'm just asking for a little bit of clarity. That's all I'm asking. Okay, for. so I want to I want to go ahead and redirect this meeting because I feel that it's getting away from us. Because right now, what we want to look at first, and then you will have a chance, you know, if we need you, to come up as well. Right now, we want to start with Mr. Alex, and then we want to get Ivan up here so he can tell us exactly what's going on. And then if you all also assisted with the process, then we can get you up here. But I want to stay focused on what we're doing here. We're not doing, we're not going to start pointing fingers and, and blaming so and so. All, all we want to do is this is what's happening now and we need a resolution, which is why the next two weeks we're going to stop and we're going to try to resolve this. So I want to bring Mr. Alex back and Ivan back. I don't know Ivan's last name. Garcia. You all can take a seat, and then we'll you know, bring you all can, forward, can I, too. Can I make one quick comment? 
Regarding the natatorium, there's yes. always uh, there's always been a second mobilization in the entire pool area, mm -hmm. competition and warming pool. And that inten the intention of that was to come in and finalize the, those piers because as they they can't be finished until the walls are put in for the pool itself and all of it is backfilled up up to the finished floor elevation yeah. and then the geo pier or Peterson yeah. would come back and and finish them. Finish okay. them. So just what just, we're talking I, about is yeah. something that is but, not finalized yet on the perimeter right. and the outside for the pools. I think the, the point the, the point is is that the, on our agenda we have a presentation from uh, Mr. Alex in place, so that's right. what we would like to listen to okay. first. So my apologies for trying no, no, to go. No, 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 it's, no, it's, no, not, no it's not your. your no, sir, your, it's not. It's, it's not your, your. It's not your issue. You don't have to apologize for anything. I was just asking for clarity, and I'm going to get it. You guys are here, it's, so we're going to get clarity so, today. Thank you. I would just say, Mr. Lopez, that it's perfectly natural for us all to wonder what happened. I mean, we've done the same thing. Correct. I mean, we have been for the moment that we found out about it, but it hasn't been our focus it, it, to find out who did what and why it happened. Our focus has been primarily investigative at this point. Uh, we're trying to figure out how pervasive the problem is, to what degree and scale it is, because problem solvers have to know what the problem is first before we can come up with the solution. And the problem could be vast or it could be small. And so we will certainly get to the point of understanding how this happened and who the, who, who's responsible for it all. But I need everyone on board to work together. I really do. To solve this problem, it's going to take everybody engaged, from the contractor to the engineers to you guys, to resolve this in a timely manner. If we all start pointing fingers at each other, we're all going to get balkanized, we're going to get siloed, and we're going to stop communicating. I need this communication to happen. And what we're presenting to you today is simply findings. I have no solutions at this time. We need two weeks at least to come up with solutions. Because one size does not fit all here. There are a number of peers that are off their intended target. Some may be within tolerances that would be fine. Others may not be. And so they'll, we'll have to come up and look at every one of the peers, I think, and try to determine what we need to do. But what we want to do here today is just, first of all, just inform you of what's going on. And I hope you understand. I know it's hard to be patient about this. Uh, it is a serious issue. We're taking it very seriously. OK? So Mr. Alex, can I ask you a quick question? You sure, said, Mr. Corona. So you're bringing up something you found now. But you said you found something back in March of 2022. We've so had, are we, is it still related to the same thing, the geo peers, or is that something totally different? We've had foundational concerns since back in March of 2022. And the foundation is directly related to the placement of the geo peers because they have to be one on top of the other. <coughs> so if we're finding beams that are resting on top of these peers in the, in the wrong location, uh, or for finding discrepancies of where the building should be, it's cause for concern. Right. So we've had those concerns back since March of last year. Okay. Mr. Alex, I just want to make a comment. Um, you just mentioned that you need communication with us and y'all are going to communicate with the contractors, the engineers, and then in two weeks you might have a list of solutions. And all of that solutions that will be brought to us will be collaborative with all of the entities involved in the construction phase. Correct? I would love to have everyone collaborate, yes. Everybody we're we're going to need that. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're going to have this, this two-week period to do this. Hopefully it won't take any longer than that, uh, but that's the idea, yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. So, Ivan, Ivan, I, Ivan, continue. I don't know your last name, if not, I call Garcia. 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 Okay. That's no such problem. a hard last name to remember. No, 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 no. It's all good. Uh, just continuing with the explanation, you can see this other location, right, where the pier is also offset in both directions south and, and east as well. The point, again, where the red arrow is pointing to, that's where the actual pier is. And you can see pier number 36, where its intended location should be. Um, pier 56. 56, I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my eyes, it's been a long day, I'm sorry. Um, Mike, could you go to the, I guess, another one? And again, it's just, I'm just going to go over a few of them, just 
so you can see the discrepancies. But you can see that in this particular building, it seems to be constant, but it's really not. So we also suspect a slight rotation on the piers because one thing would be for everything to be shifted in just one direction, perfectly aligned, which, uh, and I'll go into the pack, it, it's the, the case in the pack. But in the, in the natatorium, it seems like there's a slight rotation. So uh, that, that's another potential issue, right? Um, so just to summarize on the natatorium, we found these, right? Um, like the contractor was saying, there are some areas where the piers are fixing to be redone, right? Uh, but the concern is that if they are redone in the same location, well, they will be in the wrong location, right? So again, this information would help provide the solutions that Mike was, uh, ask, uh, I guess, referring to. Um, you, yes, if you, if you don't mind, let's go to the performing arts, please. So Mr. Garcia, you have two different foundations and on both of them is where the, on both of them is where the piers are off? Yes. It's not just on one foundation, it's mm -hmm. on both. It's a different uh, situation on each, right? Right, but, but they're still they're offline still off. on both of them, not just one, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir, sir with, with, Mr. Garcia, I got a question for you. So for you, with your experience, is this, I mean, is this common? Mm. Is, is this, you know, for these, for these peers to be moving or, or, or shifting. for them to, for shifting or for them to add to, I guess I'm assuming, you know, I'm not a contractor, but to add more peers or vice versa, is this? I'm I mean, not, which, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I'm just asking if our geo peers are concerned, because I'm not, I'm not a contractor, but if our geo peers are concerned, do, are they likely to, you know, to, uh, to shift at times? Um, the way I understand the construction process for this specific type of foundation is uh, the perimeter of the building would be determined, right? Then uh, using standard surveying procedures, you would establish uh, the design or proposed locations for those building corners. And based on that, lay out the grid, basically the center of those piers, so that the contractor that comes and do the, the, the boring, right? would actually put them in line, right, within tolerance at those intended locations. Once the piers are finished and everything's complete, um, and again, I, I don't have all the specifics, but the way I understand it is that there has to be a certain, because uh, they're covered in dirt, there's a certain height uh, of, uh, I guess, select field that needs to be on top of those pier uh, terminations. And then the surveyor comes again stake out the same building perimeter or corners to make sure that it's in the right location, right on top of the piers. And then the, the forming for the building foundation starts, like it's a regular uh, uh, slab on grade foundation, right? So in, in this case, the GeoPier outline perimeter should be here with all the GeoPiers done, and then the surveyor comes again and lays out the same footprint within that same location so that the forms end up right where they need to be on top of the geopiers. So if I'm understanding correctly, there's the surveyor comes out twice then? Yes. Prior to pouring concrete the, well, and then afterwards to make sure that it's within line? That would be a standard later. procedure. And, and having some field marks and benchmarks throughout the first setup, you would confirm that you are sitting on the same locations to make sure that you stake out the same locations again, making sure all that. In this case, since the GeoPiers were all covered, mm -hmm. there were no physical indication of where they were unless the surveyor had left some marks or benchmarks or even the contractor that did the GeoPiers to confirm that, okay, there are some marks here, the four corners, and we can align it and making sure that everything's there. Again, that's standard procedure. I don't know how this happened particularly, but if we would have done it, we would have done it like that. So Understood. do you think, not do you think, in your opinion, is it possible that it could be due to the weathering or the land that the GOP is in may have mm -hmm. shif shifted it, or that's not likely at all? Um, I, again, from what I've seen, is it a flood zone? it's very unlikely that the piers would move. So it's very unlikely that it's a weathering issue for the GOP. Uh, for location wise, I would say yes. Okay. Again, I'm not an expert, it's just an opinion. But. Okay. Sure, so I guess the, the person that would have the, the answers to all this would probably be the company that put the GOPers in place and then for them to show a blueprint of what they, what they followed. Mm -hmm. This is the blueprint. 
Yes, that, the one with the little circles, that was provided by Geopeer, which is actually, it's actually the company that designed it, right? Uh, they would be able to elaborate a little bit yeah, more okay. on any potential issues or shifting and all and, that. Yeah, they could answer why they're, mm -hmm. they're not with us. Okay, I got you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so, I, Ivan, real quick. Monday. Is it the potential that the Geopeer shifted? Because I don't think that that is what's happening here. The Geopeer didn't shift. What happened was the foundation wasn't put on the Geopeer. It appears so. So <laughs> it wasn't a shift or like you're saying erosion or, or something happened where, oh, the Geopeer was here and now it's over here. That's not what happened. It appears so. And yes. so once again, if they had had the markers, like you said, some type of way to mark that area, then that, then that would have probably ensured that the foundation could have been put in the correct place rather than us assuming that, it, it, that the Geopeer shifted. It would have been standard surveying procedures. Correct. All right. Thank and you. And who does surveying? An engineer, correct? A uh, registered professional land surveyor. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we're okay. licensed by the state of Texas to perform survey activities Wait, throughout. Who who oh, well, I don't know. Okay. Who would that be? Is that an assumption, or are we sure we didn't have a no, survey? We're not placing blame right now. We're getting information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. On the performing arts, it was a little different situation because we have most of the slabs already in place, right? And there was just an area in the middle that it's open that we were able to uh, excavate to locate some piers. We weren't able to locate any, any of them along the perimeter. It was a middle, middle area. So it's a little bit more difficult uh, to align the drawings to the locations that we have on the field just because we don't have a, a perimeter or straight line, if you will. So if, if you zoom out a little bit, uh, Mike, Please, that way we, you can see uh, what, what I'm describing. Okay, a again, those black marks that you see in the middle, those are the peer locations, the actual peer locations. Uh, we went through the same exercise. We picked up the ASPI locations, aligned the proposed plan, and then compared it to the points that we found as the center of the pillars. Again, the pillars are two foot wide. They're gravel, basically, caliche. So there's no concrete that we can measure an exact center. So we try to accurately try to place the instrument at the center of the pier, and that's how we got those locations. On this one, different from the natatorium, it seems like the shift is just in one direction, which is just the south direction. Basically, it seems to be aligned in any other location. It's just a shift. And again, we're not talking like five feet. I think on this one, the average was 1.64 feet. So it's about uh, 20 inches, more or less, that we're seeing that, uh, that shift. Again, it's constant, which, uh, again, I'm not sure if it's good or bad, but it's constant, and it doesn't appear to be rotated. Again, in this case, we're just comparing it to the ones that we have. The other, and, and this is basically the ones in the middle. You can see some yellow lines. Those are projections of where the center of those piers is, right? And that's where the foundation beams should be sitting on. In this case, there's nothing done yet, but that's, those are the locations. But we also picked up some locations are one of the main supporting columns of the buildings, which are those two green, those two red arrows that you see there. Those are very important structural elements throughout the building that would support the roof and major structural elements, right? So this uh, was a recommendation by the actual structural engineer, by Hinojosa Engineering, uh, from the design team to uncover these and pick those up because if those are wrong and foundation and, and columns are, are, are installed, th those are uh, potential, I guess, problems, right? So we also uh, picked up those and found the same discrepancy, uh, a shift to the south from those intended center point locations. Um, uh, Sir, so do you think the more weight you add on this foundation, the more shifting there's going to be? Um, Would that again, be possible? It, in my opinion, I don't think the piers are going to move oh, okay. after they're, they're installed and the, the foundation slab is They'll be stationary. They're, they're buried 30 or 40 feet deep into the ground, so they're not going to move. Yes. They won't move anymore. So, Mr. Mike, I, I guess the question that, that I have, and if you can't answer it, that's fine. I guess... You know, um, I know you guys are going to be talking about the remedy to all this. Um, I mean, it's very obvious he thinks it could be just a little, you know, movement here, movement there. But I, I guess my my uh, I guess my question is, you know, uh, to you, sir, is is 
um, would you just would you think that the remedy would be just to add peers or add perhaps, some? Perhaps, perhaps yeah. that is one perhaps uh, alternative solution. Yes. Okay. Um, and so, just to kind of wrap this all up, if y'all don't have any other questions, I would just say that. If it hasn't been told to y'all yet, we have stopped work on both buildings, okay? And, um, and so to take this two-week period, because we, we wanted to make sure we didn't build vertically anymore, and then just we'd have to take things down and perhaps, as you say, Mr. Lopez, add new piers in new locations that would be in the way of whatever vertical construction we happen to ha have out there. So, you know, we just thought it was prudent to stop now uh, and, and hopefully we'll get some results for y'all very soon. Some I will last question for you. Mm -hmm. You've been out there for how long, sir? About two year, two years? Mm -hmm. Getting close to two. Have years. you guys been flooded out? I mean, I keep hearing it's a flood area. Has that place really flooded out? I mean, we had an abundance of rain. The contractor will tell you we had an abundance of rain at the very beginning of the project. I think I've mentioned that to you. And so, yes, water did stand, but, but it doesn't you flood. flood. It, out, it, it, it doesn't flood. I mean, eventually it runs off or evaporates, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. And I think just, just to, to uh, reiterate when, what you heard me ask as far as the flood zone, I meant, what I meant to say is with, uh, with all the rain that we've gotten, they become, uh, what do you all refer to them as? They, you all, when you all have to pull out the water? They dewater. They dewater, water, de basically, water. right? De and so, but, but that has been a problem. I mean, yeah. with, a, with a tremendous yes. amount and of rainfall we get That's with any construction project. Of course. Uh, you're of course. going to dewater, especially okay. when you have an abundance of rain, yes. To finish this presentation off, the geo peers have not shifted. That is not the issue that's been discovered. That, that's correct. The geo peers are not in the right place per the design. And I don't think that was anything that we, I, I don't recall that ever being a, an issue as Neither far as the, the geo peers moving. It was the foundation, the, the foundation. When we say they've moved, right. we're physically out there seeing that they're not in their they're, right location. Correct. Because of the foundation being placed on. The foundation not on is there. not in the right place. Correct. And, and the geo peers are not in the right place. Okay. Based on our designs. Okay. Well, I appreciate you bringing this to light back in March. However, I just... For transparency, the board was never aware of it. Thank you. I think it was just as of late that it was decided um, that this would be an issue as ROFA took on a stronger role. Uh, so go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say that, you know, we've seen this. We've reported it. Um, I can't tell you why it didn't get to you all individually, but we've we've talked about it. The contractor has to know that we've talked about it. We have talked about, uh, and, and they've asked for some help to resolve a couple of them. Uh, but we can't see two feet on the job site. Uh, we can see five feet, perhaps, eyeball a five-foot discrepancy. But, you know, you get beyond that and you, you know, you don't know where your benchmarks are. That's why you hire a professional civil engineer mm -hmm. to do these things. And the contractor is responsible for hiring that, that engineer, yes. So, Mike, Mike, you're, you're talking about the discovery of the, of the issue um, in March of this year, correct? No, sir. No, March of 2022. No, sir. Uh, we've, had, we've had foundational discrepancies since March of last year, yes. What, what discrepancies in March of last beams, year? Beams not being in the, in the correct location. Honeycombing happening at, found, at foundations where we've had to take foundations out and redo foundations. All of that's happened in 2022. Right, but the, the, the geo peer issue, the placement of the foundation on top of the geo peers for clarity was discovered within the last month or so, correct? Yes, um, but okay. I mean, there's the same, same subcontractors that are doing some of this work. So, I mean, we've had issues with those concerns going back to March of 2022. So, Mr. Mike, Alex, so we, uh, with, within this two week of, of, con of stopping the construction, hopefully we'll have even more clarity and, be, and uh, perhaps even uh, some options as to a possible solution, yes. correct? That's okay. correct. And hopefully it won't take longer than two weeks. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Appreciate that. Mr. Weller, did you have Mr. Workman still there, or did you want to yes, he's here. proceed and with him? He's here, yes. And the, 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 so Mr. Workman, uh, I'll let him introduce himself and talk about his, his uh, experience uh, for a bit. But he was uh, engaged just to help the district examine some of the, uh, the matters that have been brought forth on the contract um, uh, by, by Davila and has been just kind of generally helping us assess some of the issues on the project from time to time at, uh, as he's been asked to do so. Um, Kyle is a, uh, uh, Kyle Workman is a, uh, he's, a, he's worked as a construction contractor himself. Uh, he's worked as an owner's representative. Um, but Kyle, I don't want to give you a resume. Would you, uh, could you just generally describe for the board what your, uh, what your experience has been in the construction industry? Sure. Good evening, uh, Board President Moreno, Board Members, and Superintendent Sevillon. My name is Kyle Workman. I am um, Workman Construction Advisors. Uh, I, I um, like to tell people I'm a recovering general contractor who uh, became a uh, owner's representative and a, a construction expert uh, that testifies in legal matters. And one of the things that I do is um, I'm able to help uh, evaluate um, conditions on a project, both in terms of on the ground, uh, as well as through the administrative portions of the construction to uh, help understand the condition of the project, uh, the, the current uh, schedule, the current financial implications, um, and, and to try to develop a path forward. So my experience is about one half to uh, probably 60% uh, as an owner's representative uh, managing projects for owners across the state and then the other 40% or so, 40, 50%, depending on your metrics is, is done as a, uh, as a construction expert who testifies. So um, my experience is in forensic counting uh, of, of construction projects, uh, managing construction projects, both as a general contractor and as an owner's rep, uh, and then also uh, investigating uh, forensically construction defect um, issues and helping to develop those paths forward. So um, that's generally what, what Kyle's done. And then um, what we've asked him to look at as it relates to this project and, and you know, we could either have him prepare a report for us and discuss it you know, specifically in closed session. I think we've elected to just have him talk in generalities about what he's seen on some of the issues on the project and what we've determined just on a preliminary basis to kind of update the board on that. Um, some of these matters, I'll tell you right now, are, are, are matters that are in which um, uh, Davila has made active contract claims against the district. So not appropriate to have a discussion back and forth about this, but Kyle, uh, you wanted to speak uh, generally about um, first, um, there was a materials cost claim made on the project um, and our review of that and what you've seen on that. Uh, yes, my, you know, I've reviewed documents uh, from Davila for um, you know, cost escalation uh, a claim uh, in the amount of over a million dollars. Uh, I performed an analysis of the uh, actual subcontract and purchase order agreements um, and, and identified where there may have been um, either buyout savings, uh, in other words, something purchased being purchased at a lesser cost, uh, and then those that would be uh, purchased at a greater cost or a buyout deficit. And, um, you know, I, I, at this point, um, you know, with the information that I have, uh, I'm unable to, um, to have the uh, documents bear out um, the uh, position that, that Davil has taken. Do you have the documents provided? Do they do they substantiate the claim of a million dollars or more? Uh, not that I've seen. No. Okay. I don't want to get into specifics uh, of all that. And if we need to get into specifics, we probably need to uh, reduce your concern, or your your thoughts to a report and discuss in writing. But um, so basically, that's where we are. And and I can say that the documents I've seen have not shown dollar impacts. And I'm talking about Davila's materials, um, uh, on according to their materials, in the numbers they claim. 
Um, the second issue uh, that we kind of generally looked at was the the, the time and delay claim made by Davila on the project. Again, just speaking in generalities because uh, we're we're in open session right now. But um, what have been the presentations and what are what are your uh, preliminary thoughts on that, Kyle? Well, that that remains uh, the investigation remains ongoing uh, primarily because we just received. Uh, updated schedules recently um, uh, that uh, kind of indi find that indicated a critical path. I'm not sure that I can follow the critical path on the schedules. It's it's they're being prepared through Microsoft Project, um, which is a little less of a sophisticated program um, and allows for manipulation of the critical path. So um, a little bit more detailed analysis has to take place, but. Um, in the end, uh, it, you know, what we can see now is that it, it's difficult to see any uh, concurrency concerns being addressed. In other words, where there may be multiple delays on a particular uh, time frame, uh, how those delays are being addressed, it, it, it seems like um, those may be, you know, some may be uh, not included uh, in the analysis. Um, and it's not really much of an analysis, really a presentation of some schedules back from uh, earlier in the project uh, through recently, um, but uh, you know, we haven't we haven't been able to identify where there might be concurrent delays, where uh, a procurement delay, or um, for example, the reconstruction of some of the foundation elements. Um, they may not. Um, we're not able to see where that delay uh, relate re resulted from the the failure uh, related to the construction of the of the foundation. Uh, would hit, have impacted the project as opposed to a, perhaps a weather day that took place at the same time. Um, so uh, we have to we have to continue to work through uh, getting a, a little bit more de detailed information as well as continue our investigation with the documents that have been provided. So, and what I'll say on that is we received a formal delay claim for the first time, I believe in November of, of 22. And we had a discussion with Davila. We asked them to substantiate their position with actual um, the materials that you would normally see to, to bear out allegations of a delay claim. And we got those uh, amended schedules within the last uh, a few weeks. Uh, I think it was towards the end of March when we received them. So we're looking at those. Uh, one thing about that is we have this uh, overall GOPR concept in front of the board. And so it's not Obviously, that's something we need to get resolution to in terms of the impacts it's going to have to the project schedule before we take up other schedule days from from earlier in, in the project. So those are two of the you know kind of a broad brushstroke of two of those issues. Uh, those two issues. The third one was you know I think we're trying to get to the bottom of some of the uh, questions that have been raised on the on the, the pay applications. So Kyle, what what did you see there, and what have you what have you noted? Well, initially, um, you know, I, I identified that the pay application submission process was not in accordance with the prime contract. Um, the, my understanding of this contract is, is a cost plus with a guaranteed maximum price, which by definition requires the contractor to submit their costs plus their fee, um, not just a percentage complete. And, and the, the contract is very prescriptive on how that's calculated. Um, and the uh, pay applications on a monthly basis are to include a package, so to speak, is to include uh, all the necessary supporting uh, invoicing, petty cash, expenses, uh, payroll reports, that kind of thing, in order to justify every amount that's being billed. Um, that, was, uh, that was not taking place until, I believe, pay application number 17 or 18, which is more, one of the more recent ones after this was identified. Um, we've now received some documentation uh, provided by Davila that went to uh, try to recreate those for previous pay payment applications. Uh, uh, there's some discrepancies in there. I haven't got all the way through them. They're, they're pretty voluminous. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, there are things that, are, that appear to be duplicative, that appear to be some things that may be um, you know, uh, costs that would be attributable to a, the failure of RGV, as an example. Um, some of the supporting documentation is even clearly labeled as back charge to RG RGV, yet used to support their uh, costs associated with the project. So 
Um, you know, I think we're just going to have to continue to work through that, uh, continue to gra get, uh, gather some additional information. Um, you know, as I've mentioned before, it's my recommendation that we get a current transaction log um, uh, that allows us to understand all of the cost in one uh, uh, fail swoop, so to speak, in one spot, um, and then all the associated invoices that uh, would be uh, uh, commensurate with that so that we can then look at the next pay application and make sure that it gets trued up. Um, we don't necessarily have to resolve all the previous ones. Um, we just have to make sure that going forward, the, the uh, payment application amounts match the uh, costs that have been incurred on the project that are compensable. Um, the contract is not, it, it is not um, wide open in terms of any cost that they incur on the project is, a is, is compensable. There are limitations to that. Um, uh, in Article 6, and, and so certain costs have to be evaluated against those limitations to make sure that they're even attributable or can be, a, can be applied to the, the project uh, finances. Um, and so uh, there would have to be an analysis of both the actual cost incurred um, and, and, and their applicability associated with it uh, as it relates to the contract. So, you know, just to briefly sum up, we brought this issue to the forefront. We brought it up with Avila. We noted it, that we have concerns about it. There's no debate, there's no dispute that the applications weren't submitted uh, as the contract calls for. We're in the process, we've asked them to submit the prior pay apps. They have submitted some information to us as of last week, we're looking at it. We're gonna examine it carefully, we're gonna make sure that we're getting to the bottom of it and doing what, everything we need to be doing for the district on the project. We're going to examine, you know, what was what was charged and what we paid for to date, and assure that um, we're handling this correctly moving forward. Yes. Any questions for Kyle? Yes, sir. I got, Mr. What do I do? Who approved of these payouts? I know we had the discussion again, but just for the record, so everybody everybody knows who approved of these payouts. Uh, pay applications were approved uh, by ROFA and by Brighton, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Workman. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Alex, thank you. Have a good night. Ms. I have a quick question. When they said that they were making presentations, who were they making those presentations to? They, they actually have OACs that they go to. This is where Mr. Saldana and Mr. Cole attend. I know that they come back and they uh, give me a summary of the report. I know that before Brighton, uh, we were no longer contracted with Brighton, uh, Palacios would go. And so um, he would also give reports of what they would discuss there. As far How as like- were those meetings? Or are they like weekly, bi-weekly? Yeah, weekly? the weekly. I mean, we have them. They just had one. <coughs> and oh, Ms. Martinez goes now as well. Oh, bi-weekly? Mm -hmm. so, so, so Mr. Rion, just for the, just for, for clarification. So <laughs> all these findings like, you know, Rofa and, and, and you know, and uh, Palacios and, and Davila, uh, they all have to submit a, do they submit a report monthly to you? They, there are reports submitted, but they're incomplete. They didn't have everything that now I have been able to obtain or Mr. Weller has been able to obtain. So, so it would go directly to Mr. Palacios. Mr. Palacios would put what the- Mr. Wanted, Rayon, yes. may, I, may I just, can we, I mean, if we need to discuss this, I really think that in we should be discussing this okay. in executive session. This isn't, uh, uh, Thing, uh, anything that we need to be discussing up in, in public right now. Well, the thing they would just discuss right now. The consultant you guys hired is just went ahead and, you know, just talked about his discovery. So all I'm asking is who approved it? Yeah. That's. And we've discussed that in executive session before, so you should already have the answer so we can really discuss right, it I'm once again. Well, I'm asking Sergio right now because he just brought it up again. And I can ask that question. Okay, okay but what, your, what is your question? Who approved it? You got the answer. So now what's the question? The, the, the answer to that I got the answer. is. is the answer to that is, is much more than just this person or that person. There are certain parties that have contractual duties, and it's, it's really very much a legal issue. You can't 
discuss I, contractual I make a motion. No, 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 but, but that's fine, Mr. Waller, but the only reason why I was asking, because we've never spoken to the gentleman before, that's the reason why I was asking, just for clarity. Okay. I second well, the motion. You. The motion has been made by Mr. Medrano to table this and, and move into executive session if any further discussion is needed. So do we have a vote? Can we vote on if ceasing discussion? Yes. All those in favor? What's the motion? One, two, three, four. Oh. Um, to go into executive session to continue discussing any of this. Motion carries. Four, three. Okay, moving on to consent agenda items under academic services. Request approval of the memorandum of understanding between San Benito CISD and Neighbors and Needs of Services, Inc. Head Start, Early Head Start program for the 23-24 school year. Questions? Consent. Item 7.2, request approval of the instructional materials allotment and TEAK certification for the 23-24 school year. Questions? Consent. Item 8.1, request approval to accept gifts and bequests for the 22-23 school year. Questions? Consent. Item 8.2, request approval of budget amendments for the 22-23 school year. Questions? Consent. Item 8.3, request approval of cash account report. Questions? Consent. Item 8.4, request approval of tax collection report for March 2023. Questions? Consent. Item 8.5, request approval of check disbursements for March 2023. Questions? Consent. Item 8.6, request approval of quarterly investment report. Questions? Consent. Item 8.7, request approval of quarterly federal funds comparison report. Questions? Consent. Item 8.8, .8, request approval to extend proposals on RFP 0321 Charter Bus Services District Wide. Questions? Consent. Under administration, item 9.1, request approval of revisions to the 22-23 compensation plan. Questions? Consent. Item 9.2, request approval of revisions to policy BED local. Questions? Questions. Okay. Item 9.3, request approval of board minutes. Question? Consent. I said board minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. So 10 point so, one. So action agenda. That's action agenda already. Yes. Okay, so at this at this point I would ask for a motion to approve consent agenda items 7.1, 7.2, 8.1 through 8.8, .8, and 9.1 as presented. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Gomez. Do I have a second? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I skip 9.3? I'm sorry. 9.3 as well. Sorry about that. So, motion by Mr. Uh, Gomez. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Silva. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6 0. Okay, we move back to item 9.2. Uh, Dr. Cruz, you had a question? On the revision to BED local, I was looking at the emails that were sent between Mr. Gallegos and the TASB policy person. Um, it's still not very clear. So if I'm reading it correctly, any regular board meetings, which include meetings that are subject to the Open Meetings Act, like committee meetings, are allowed the five minutes public mm -hmm. comment. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then special meetings are the only ones where the- They're not. Public li comment is limited to items on the agenda only. Yes, ma'am. All right, so committee meetings, regular board meetings, five minutes, any in which topic a community member would like to discuss, and then what would be a special meeting? Just We normally have special board meetings, like for example, if there's items on the agenda that we need to approve um, that we didn't put in the agenda, then the superintendent might call for a special board meeting um, for you know any items that were left out, like the one we had last week. But we had the committee meeting, so it really didn't. It's still a special board meeting. After the committee meetings, you call a special board meeting, and that's what that's what's in, called a special board meeting. I understand, but for public comment purposes, people were able to provide their public comment because it was included in the committee meeting. But had that been a standalone special meeting, it wouldn't have. 
they would not they be allowed. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Correct. And, and just if I may add something on that uh, to, to go to Dr. Cruz's question. So typically speaking, anything other than the, than the one regular meeting per month is considered a special meeting. So a committee meeting, anything other than a regular meeting where a quorum of the board is present and you have a called meeting is considered a special meeting. So if we're, if the, if the adjustment would allow for spe uh, the speaker to address any topic in a committee meeting as well, then we should delineate it as clearly a committee meeting. If it's, if it's only intended to apply the, the regular meeting once a month, then by keeping the words regular meeting, that would denote that one regular meeting. I'm sorry, I had a clear understanding and then you confused me. You know, it, it, what I'm saying is <laughs> technically, when you use the word regular meeting, that's the one regular board meeting. It's, it, you wouldn't Today. consider a committee meeting to be a regular meeting. So then committee meetings would not allow for the five minutes of public comment? But that's the point I'm making is that it's up to the board as to how you want to handle that. But if you want to make it committee meetings, then I recommend that the policy specifically call out committee meetings and regular meetings. Mr. Willard, Tasby recommended that we not delineate specifically. So, mm -hmm. um, and that was their recommendation, like with, with the special board meetings or committee meetings. So, um, Mr. Gallegos, did you want to elaborate? Am I correct with that recommendation? That is correct. Um, when I asked TASB for further clarification, when one of the um, public com comments was made in reference to should we delineate, you know, what's a uh, committee meeting or what's a special board meeting, um, on that email that you all have as a backup, uh, TASB does recommend that we do not specify um, or be very clear on what's a committee meeting or a special board meeting. Um, they do consult this with their own legal um, counsel, and that's the verbiage that they, they recommend that we follow. Okay. I think we can. That, that's up to the board um, on that. Any further questions? I don't, I, don't, I don't know that it applies clarity to which meetings it refers to, though. Yeah, because in reading the email from TASB, I know that there's other school boards that have committee meetings that aren't subject to the Open Meetings Act because it doesn't include the quorum of the board. And Correct. since all of our committee meetings do are subject to mm -hmm. the Open Meetings Act, I guess we have like a, a special situation. So I think that this policy does need to delineate that regular board meetings and committee meetings will be allowed public comment. Okay. Go ahead. I, I, I mean, any further discussion on this? Okay. Mr. I, I have a question. Okay. I, I would like to have Mr. Weller or superintendent and I think it needs to be a little bit more clear mm -hmm. that's what I would suggest I want to make sure that the public understands okay. you know and when? it needs to be clear if, if Mr. Weller is the person to redo the policy or add to it and then we can bring it back and table it? that would be probably for my suggestion discussion. yeah for further discussion I just don't want the public to misunderstand or misread and I think we're all in, what you read is a little bit confusing to me Thank you, Mr. Gomez. When I yeah. say it, it's yes. Thank you. Okay. I, think, I, I agree with Mr. Gomez. Thank I'm you. sorry. I think what Tasby is saying is that a regular board meeting are regular meetings that are standing. So the way it reads is committee meetings are regular standing meetings, right? We are always going to have committee meetings. And that's what Mr. Gallegos is trying to say. And I know, Mr. Weller, you have a different perception. But what Tasby is saying is if you have regular scheduled meetings like your regular board meeting, your committee meetings, those are subject to the, you know, to public uh, comment. comment. But if you have a special meeting, like a special call oh, or a right. hearing or anything like that, that would be where you do not have to have the, you know, public the open, uh, the public the comment, meeting. I'm sorry. So that's exactly what TASB is saying. And that is what they have told us. Okay. So. If we wanted to exclude committee meetings, we would have to specifically say we're excluding our commi committee meetings because for us, those are regular standing meetings. Committee and our regular meetings. 
You're right, Mr. Weller, some people or some districts do not include their committee meetings, just regular board meetings. Yeah. We had that discussion with TASB. So for us, our regular meetings are committee, standing meetings, and our board meetings. That's that the is, policy. That is certainly correct, that okay. those, are, those are normal and standard. So and, and, and another point is it's really, those kinds of specific interpretations of the policy are within the board's authority to say, you know, this is what we consider regular meetings. Unless you want to omit the committee meetings, then that would be a whole other, you know, verbiage. I, I think that the, that public comment in the in the committee meetings. I mean, that's another opportunity for our, for our community to come in and speak on either any item on the agenda or any 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 topic whatsoever. But again, within those those uh, those parameters where we give them the five minutes to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so let me, let me just tell you, I'm gonna go on to what TASB indicated. What TASB indicated is when you have standing meetings, the community knows way ahead of time that they're coming. So they can prepare for their public comment, right? So they want to bring it then, they know we have these committee meetings this week, we have this committee, we have a standing board meeting. That, those are regular. I just wanna be very clear that it's also to provide clarity to the community. So that's the way the policy is written. Mr. Gomez, did you make a motion to table this? No. No, I didn't. Uh, Mr. You made a motion? Make a motion? Okay. motion to table. I do make a motion to table this for now and, and get some more clarity on I'll it. I'll second that. Okay. okay. We have a motion on the floor by Mr. Gomez and a second uh, by Mr. Medrano to table this item. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, motion carries 7-0. Moving on to action agenda item. We have action agenda item 10.1, discussion, consideration, and possible approval regarding purchases over 25,000. Ms. Cedrillon? Yes, my, recommend oh, my recommendation to the board is that we approve all purchases over 25,000 as presented. Board members, any questions? Okay, if not, do I have a motion to approve uh, purchases over $25,000 as presented? So move. We have a motion by Orlando Lopez. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Dr. Ariel Cruz. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Mr. Gomez. Okay, motion carries 6-0. Seven. Seven, there you are, I didn't see you. I thought you had left. <laughs> Item 10.2, discussion, consideration, and possible approval regarding purchases over 25,000 from Gold Coast paper, Gulf Coast paper. Ms. Cervillon? Yes, I also recommend the board approve purchases over 25,000 from Gulf Coast paper. Do I have any questions? Okay, uh, do I have a motion to approve purchases over 25,000 from Gulf Coast Paper? So moved. We have a motion by Oscar Medrano. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Rudy Corona. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, all those opposed? None, and one abstention. Motion carries. Item 10.3, review discussion and possible approval of comparison of revenue and expenditures to budget report for March 2023. Mr. Rayon. Yes, I recommend that the board approve the comparison of revenue and expenditures to budget report for March 2023. Board members, any questions on this item? Okay, if not, do I have a motion to approve a com the comparison of revenue and expenditures to budget report for March 2023? Okay, we have a motion by Mario Silva. Do I have a second? Second by Dr. Ariel Cruz. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay, item 10.4, review discussion and possible approval of 2023-2024 school calendar. Ms. Cervellon. Yes, um, Dr. McGee has some data for you all tonight so that you can see um, actually how our staff voted. They had a choice between calendar A and B. Dr. McGee. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? <laughs> Almost. Oh. <laughs> Good evening, Board President Moreno, Board of Trustees, and uh, Superintendent Servion. May I have a moment of indulgence, and then may I approach? If I could give a moment of indulgence to just um, shout out Mr. E, because not only does he help students, but he helps teachers and staff members, even myself, and that just means so much. And when he says he's a team player, he really is. So thank you for that. Now, okay. Thank you for acknowledging that as well. Thank you. 
So I wanted to provide you this evening with an overview of um, our procedures uh, to get to a recommendation from the superintendent. Um, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez uh, did send notifications out via email on March 9th and March 21st. We did receive 831 online votes, 250 uh, paper votes cast. As you see, the calendar selected by majority vote was calendar A. Um, I did put references to both calendar choices. I wanted you to see the graphics from the voting. Uh, paper ballots were emailed to the respective departments and the directors did submit those counts via email. Um, we also thought it was important that you saw the votes by position or department. Uh, if you notice, in terms of the totals, 601 votes for calendar A, 480 votes for calendar B. Uh, 1,081 votes represents about 65% of our total uh, employee base. Any questions? There's, <laughs> there's a... The 27th and 28th of July are marked as new teacher days. I don't know yeah. what they're officially called. New, new teacher, teacher orientation. orientation. Yes. And then the 31st isn't anything? Teachers report, report on the 1st of August? If you approve uh, this calendar, they will report on the 1st of August. Okay. So that Monday is just a... Our 226 employees will be reporting to work. Okay. Yes. In our 240s. <laughs> so what I want to say is a uh, 1,081 is a really high number of votes and so uh, we want to get everybody but we did extend it an additional month to make sure we gave it more time so thank you Dr. McGee for your hard work thank you thank you to everybody welcome everybody was out there Yes, it, and it was and definitely a Nancy team. Or, or, yeah, I was about Adesani. to shout out <laughs> Nancy Arisella. They they really Mr. worked Cole, it. Yes, the... thank y'all because it, it was a team effort, and without that, we wouldn't have had our paper ballots. And it was so important for us to have our maintenance, our cafeteria staff, just everybody have a voice. And so that was important. May I please uh, note some slight changes uh, in the note? I did want to note, going back to just based on conversations, we did um, look at our early release starting in time. So those did shift based on um, conversations and concerns. So thanks again, Mr. Martin, uh, Mrs. Martinez. Um, also, uh, the other shift is, is that on March 1st, 2003, the uh, TEA did uh, report new data in terms of star testing dates. So all of the star testing dates in April did shift. And so we did have to make that note on the calendar. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Contu for bringing that at, to our attention to make sure you had that before you voted. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Thank you. So Ms. Cervellon, do you have a recommendation? Yes, sir. Um, so I recommend the board approve calendar A for the 23-24 school year. Okay, Ms. Cervellon has made a motion to approve calendar A for the 2023-20, not a motion, a, a recommendation to approve uh, calendar A for the 2023-2024 school year. Do I have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Oscar Medrano, second. Second. Second by uh, Mr. Gomez. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Item 10.5, discussion, consideration, and possible approval on selecting an insurance consultant for RFP 0323 ICEHB Insurance Consultant for Employee Health Benefits. Ms. Cervellon? Yes, sir. So earlier on, I think you all got four packets. And so what the team did was they evaluated those, um, those companies, those consultants for employee health benefits, and we are going to have presentations Next, I think we're going to have a special call next week, as a matter of fact, so that we can have those presentations so that the board can also determine uh, which one of the four would be the best uh, to service our employees. So at this point, there's no action, just a review from the board needed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rayon. 
All right, next is closed meeting. In accordance with Texas Government Code Open Meetings Act, the board may move into closed session for the following reasons. Section 551.071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board's attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law. Section 551.074, for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, or to hear complaints or charges against a public officer or employee. The time is 9.25. We move into executive session. All right, the time is 10.28, and we reconvene into open session. There is uh, no further business to discuss, or do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, we have a motion by Oscar Medrano. Second? Second. Second. <laughs> Second by Orlando Lopez. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 6-0. Meeting adjourned at 10.28.